All right. We gotta be careful who we see. You ready for cowboy pizza time? Is that a th- at what? What does that mean? Cowbunga. Cowbunga. Chicken party. Let's do it. All right. Um. <laughs> oh, we're recording. I didn't <laughs> yeah, we're recording this I whole said, time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Formatted recording. Yeah. All right, let's do it. <clears throat> See, now I feel like we need like a proper lead in because I, I wasn't even I've been there. leading in, man. I'm ready. All right. All right. Let's yeah! get my sunglasses. We can we can to Bernie's me here. That's right. <laughs> All right. Ready? Welcome, everyone, to episode number 65 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about how retailer exclusives can benefit the manufacturers. Never been asked that question before. That's or bring good. them down. Hopefully not, in but we'll find out. Fiery explosion. Stay tuned. Um, We're going to talk about how to clean pens if you can't take them apart. Uh, The impact of currency exchange rates on pen prices with a deep dive warning on that one. Uh, We have our favorite and least favorite pen clips. Uh, We talk about if rhodium trim sells better than gold trim or if that's just a perception. And we have an Instagram poll with some pen stuff that's kind of fun. We have a spotlight on the new Rickshaw Sinclair with a sneak peek Goulet exclusive that's not even on our site yet. So y'all are going to be the first to see it. And we'll see if that's a terrible idea or not because the customer care team might come back to us and be like, y'all got to not talk about things that you don't have on the site because we got us a million questions. But we'll see how it goes. We're trying it out. We want to be special for y'all. But anyway, we're going to start it out with some feedback. All right. Feedback All right. from Anna C. Mm. Anna says, Drew, I loved your answer to the how did fountain pens change your life question. I can relate so much. I got deep into fountain pens in 2020 and throughout 2020 and 2021, I relied so much on this hobby, including the pen cast, since its start. It gave me enjoyment, excitement, and a sense of community when none of these things were easily available to me outside of this. Mm. Thankfully, 2022 has been much better for me. So it's no longer 80%, which is a reference to how I said how much a hobby could potentially be taking up, you know, you. Um, So every now and then it's 80 for, and it's no longer at 80. So great for you. Um, (laughs) But I know how that feels. And yes, to have all of these people unite over something positive is precious. The fountain pen community is the most positive and friendly space I've come across online. Mm -hmm. Love it. Agreed. Thank you. 100% agreed. That's yeah. exactly what I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for putting that out there. And thank you for taking the time to just write that in a YouTube comment section. Just yeah. being thankful for something positive and delightful. Like we need more of that like on the internet in general. So Anna has an attitude of gratitude. Oh, yeah. Nice. And Diana says, I didn't know that this would be a long video. It is the first pen cast I have watched. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> You're in for a treat then. <laughs> but she said, first pen cast I have watched, but loved it. Yeah. Okay. It is by far the longest video I have ever watched and will <laughs> and will watch more, but need to be mindful when I want to start watching because I get up at 2.30 a.m. Oh my Ooh, gosh, whoa. Diana. Wow. Luckily tomorrow it's Saturday and I don't have to be at work until 9 a.m. instead of 3.15 like Ooh. weekdays. Woo. Wow. You are my two favorite people to watch on the net, and thank you for all of the info you share. The net. Thank you, Diana. I like that. The net. That's right. Remember that? Yeah, Sandra Remember Bullock. That? Like the 90s? <laughs> yeah, that's that was right. like what everybody called it, the World Wide Web. Yep. The net. Thank you. I, I appreciate that's cool. that. And uh, yeah, if you are not familiar with the Pencast, I could understand how it would be yeah. a bit much to dive right into. You'd be like, but why do people are watching this thing? What yeah. is this all about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, it can it can be a bit lengthy if you're not ready for it. But uh, I'm glad you stuck with us, despite mm-hmm. it surprising you with its uh, duration. Existence, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's basically like the length of a full length feature film every week that we're putting out here. So, I don't know. You're welcome. Uh, Clark's got some feedback. Says, Brian, I was surprised by your regular use pens, Twisby and Lamy. They're amazing pens, and I use the same. But with a warehouse full of pens, how do you keep from using all those wonderful pens? Plus, what nibs are in those pens? Um, So, those are the ones you took to the conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that is a little different because when I'm traveling and, like, going somewhere, I might take different pens. I'm not going to take, like, some limited edition thing that's irreplaceable because it's, like, 
whatever. If I if something happens to it, I lose it. It's damaged. Yeah, you talked like about that. some very yeah. specific reasons for why you brought yeah. the two thousand and the um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm ego. going somewhere where I know that people are going to be asking me, and I'm like talking in a business context about pens, I'll take kind of more universal ones that aren't like crazy expensive, you know, and uh, so people can get a pretty good impression of like what a fountain pen even is. Uh, but if I'm just traveling completely on my own for some reason that's outside of anything related to pens, then I'm more inclined to just kind of bring whatever I feel like. Uh, I have a rather extensive pen collection and oftentimes what I bring just happens to be whatever I've inked up at the time or, you know, whatever I just use on a regular basis. So, um, you know, I do try to use a whole bunch of different things, which is why I have a lot of pens that are inked up at one time and hardly clean my pens out at all because I'm using different things all the time. So it is pretty random what I decide to use. Oftentimes I just look at my pens and I'm like, what have I not used in a while? And I'll pick those things up. But usually my like nicer, more exclusive, more special pens to me, uh, I don't take those two places with me. I keep them safe and in one spot and use those more just locally. Um, but the nibs that are in them, it depends. I think I had a broad on my Twisby and I had a fine on my Lamy 2000 uh, that I used last time. So yeah, I'll do that. Uh, Daniel said, as an engineer with a strong background in material science. This is uh, astronaut glove, Daniel. Oh, yeah, right. Dan. what's up, Dan? What's up? Uh, including a wide variety of plastic and metals. Oh boy, Dan knows way more than I do. Okay, it was highly entertaining to watch Brian talk about acrylic. Okay, so it doesn't sound like Daniel wants to rip me apart here. No, 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 he, good, keep, good, keep good. going. He, right, he's right. actually very kind. Kudos to Brian, who did a credible job with a very complex and nuanced subject separating manufacturing processes from the raw materials used in those processes. All right. That is as good as it gets right there, man. That's right. And the most priceless part, Drew's facial expressions when introducing the deep dive, because you know you know what you're getting into. He like forewarns me now, and he's like, so I got this question, and... I, I guess I should include it because people like these deep dives, but he like tries to like nudge me. He's like, you know, you don't really want to talk about this. Do you He's like, <laughs> there's a lot here. And I'm like, oh, that is really interesting. I kind of do want to talk about that. Oh yeah. And then I also just, <laughs> every time someone's like, oh, I love Brian's deep dive. I'm like, oh my God, I don't encourage yeah. him. But I'm like, that's fine. It, it's, it's the Drew's, Drew's selfless, selfless I, sacrifice here. We're here. It's we're like, here for them. It's like it's not dad, about me. It's the same same face when I tell dad jokes oh, and stuff like that. I Just, think people also, you know, you know, low key enjoy my pain and suffering. You know, which I think fine, so which too. Is fine. I'm a I think of the so people. too. Yeah, yeah, you got that. I can take it. Look, yeah, it's fine. Um, okay, Ch says love watching Brian's brought blah, blah 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 loved. Okay, I can't read today. Love watching Brian's brain break when Drew was pushing him to pick a favorite resin. Yeah. That was at the very end do it. when you did that whole thing and still didn't say what whole your favorite thing. resin was. I and, yeah. then I and then I like boiled it down for you and, yeah. and you were just like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I tried the technique <laughs> of like when you don't want to have to make a choice and you just overwhelm, you know, sort yeah. of like when, a, when like, you know, a, a, a CEO or something is being interviewed by Congress and they give them like a very simple <laughs> yes or no answer and they just go off on this thing and you're like, no, 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 like right. shut your mouth, right. yes or no. What is your, th you know, and then they still don't answer it. Yeah. I love that. Uh, and then DB Kaziti, Kazitis, Kazitis, Kazitis. I can sure. go with that. Love, you guys are doing great. Two exclamations. I don't see you as salesmen, but friends. We can be both. <laughs> um, lol, yes, it is complicated as a retailer, but yo, you guys still keep it 100. All right. That's really motivating to hear because. I so, am encouraged because, by that. Because yeah. we, we are a business. We sell fountain we pens. Are. Yeah, we're not a nonprofit organization. Right. You know, the way, the way that we all feed our families right. and keep doing this is So we do need to sell fountain pens. pens. Like, that is yeah. our goal. That is why the company exists, yeah. to sell fountain pens. But, and, and we can't just sit here all day and talk about everything we hate about fountain pens because that would do no good to anybody, including ourselves. Yeah. But we also, also don't hate that much. But we also want to be genuine and, yeah. you know, be real. So mm -hmm. it is encouraging to hear that we can, you know, at least sometimes strike that balance because that yeah, is the goal. Absolutely. We, we, we're 100% we're real with you guys. We are, yeah. you know, we're, but. And, uh, and you can watch this and not buy stuff. Like you can 100%. still derive value. So like our producing of this is our way of just like giving to you all. And then if it's good information and you like it and you trust us and you want to buy stuff, great. Yeah, like that we are going to link to our own store yeah, for sure. Of course. But, 
Yeah, there's no there's no to. rule. This thing, th- th- yeah. this this doesn't cost money. I think it's a pretty good arrangement. Yeah. So anyway, very cool. All right, that's all we got for feedback this week. Let's jump into some new things, new stuff, new stuff and things. All right. <laughs> well, we got some new pens mm-hmm. from Sailor, which I know is pretty rare. <laughs> they don't come well with much new stuff. Only weekly. Uh, so this is the ringless metallic 1911. This is the mid size, the large size in the uh, 1911. So 21 round carat top. nib. 21 carat nib. Yep, the the smaller 21 carat, not the king of pen size one. Um, great nib, great pen, great size all around. I think this is a really good all around size, no matter what um, size of hand you're dealing with. This is an interesting one though, and it caused some debate internally. We actually had to look it up, like metallic. Some people are very much understood on our team that metallic means seems like metal, but is definitely not metal. And in my brain, I was like, metallic seems like like metal, but or like some kind of version of metal or like a shiny, glossy metal, whatever. But no, we looked it up. The definition is metal. It's, it's like something that appears to be metal, yeah. but it's like very, very clearly not. So just to be clear, when you're looking at this pen, it is not metal. I mean, it has metal parts, but the, the, the resin itself is not metal. It is, it is resin. Um, but it's interesting because usually Sailor just does like flat or they might have some shimmer mixed in with you know some resin but you haven't really seen any like swirly type of stuff happening on sailor i i can't recall that really being much of a thing unless there's some you know special edition somewhere there, there might whatever. have been like maybe one of the cocktails did there were so many in that set i, I wouldn't be surprised if one has passed me I by think, yeah i, I don't recall i will say that the lack of trim ring on this hence the ringless yeah uh really does bring the material to the forefront it does it, it really does. makes the material the primary focus yeah it's not the first ringless pen they've done because no, they, they had, had the ringless epinard. epinard that's that was kind of like on its way out when we picked up sailor yeah, a few we had years it ago just a little bit i don't think they've done any other ringless this is the first one since epinard right uh, when i went into our uh, server to get the pic- pictures for uh-huh. instagram yeah it was only the epinard and the ringless metallic so those are the only two I saw all right. in our server. So Fair I'm enough. guessing that's all we've ever had. Fair enough. Um, so there's three different colors of this pen. They're called Simply Gray, Simply Blue, and Simply Red, which is very clearly a red, Drew. Just pure, not a Bordeaux, not a maroon, not a burgundy. Are you sure, Brian? Not, nope. Because it doesn't look like Simply, simply Red to me. Simply Red. I'm, I'm, I'm joking a little bit here. It's more of a more of a burgundy yeah. kind of a color. Um, the blue, Mar- though. Maroogandy. Maroon, yeah. That blue, though. Mm. That's a good blue. Ooh. Ah, oh, it's good. It's good. <laughs> Brian I like that it. blue. That blue hits me in the right spot. And especially with that trim, too. Like the dark trim. Like, mm. It's really good. I like that color a lot. Uh, and then the gray is fine. It's gray. I mean, it's cool. It's gray, but I don't know. I mean, it does look, it looks a little more stealthy, like with the gunmetal trim. Do you think this pen is going to be divisive? Do you think people are going to kind of love it or hate it? Oh, man. It's so hard to say because Sailor doesn't often, I mean, they have a lot of colors, but their pens are more or less constant. I like it. This one's a little different. But it almost, I like the pen, but it Mm -hmm. it does kind of weird me out a little bit because it doesn't initially look like a Sailor. It does look a little, you got to look a little harder at it. And it's like, Mm. I, I don't know. I don't know if, it's just my brain telling me that it's different, and I'm like, ooh, yeah. I don't know, it's different. Or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I just not kind of need, need to get over it. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's interesting. It's very light, though. It, I will say there's a little cognitive dissonance in my brain because it looks so metallic. My brain wants to say this is going to be heavy, but then when I have it in my hand, it is not heavy. No, at not all, heavy at all. Which a lot of people really like. So, like as a daily writer pen, this is actually going to be incredibly comfortable to write with because it is it is relatively light. So, um, I don't know. I'm very curious. It's it's you know it's up there in price. MSRP is closer to 500. We have a little under 400. So it's it's an investment for sure. But I would say if you like the styling of this pen, it looks really really good in person. Fit and finish is really nice, and you get some of that swirly you know pearlescence kind of going on in the material. That's pretty neat. So um, all seven nib sizes of that great um, 21 karat nib. So go check those out. We have them available right now. And then another one that we've got is the Diplomat Dip, Diplomat Elox. We have a new color called Matrix, which is basically the Elox. So it's built off the Aero model, um, except it has these like ring grooves kind of cut out in it. And uh, it's got green. Well, this there. one's not rings. Oh, it's not rings. No, oh, the I'm Matrix is up? the first one that's oh, not shoot, rings. You're right. The Matrix has up, huh? these 
it's almost like a like a broken grid. Yeah. Like, oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. I mean, it's like yeah, you're right. It's not full rings. Yeah, the grid. Yeah, that is interesting. Mm -hmm. So this is a new pattern. So we've had mm. the rings in orange, blue, mm -hmm. and purple. You're right. But the green is kind of breaking the mold yeah, a little right. bit, not little going gritty. with the rings. Yeah, it's all grid-like. Yeah. You've got vertical and horizontal. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. You have both axes. Yeah. The, the Matrix, obviously, I think of the movie. It's not called The Matrix. It's called Matrix. Yeah. So it's got kind of that grid-like yeah, thing. Yeah, it's, it it's got green the on black. It's got green on black. and green. Yeah, so, like the coding screen mm -hmm. and the original Matrix. Wasn't that movie in like 1999 or something yeah, like that? Yeah, so. I believe it was late 90s. Gosh. Late, late 90s. Matrix 99. It was 1999. Wow. Two hours and 16 minutes. That's like a, <laughs> it's like a pen cast right there uh, these days. So, yeah. Man, that movie still holds up. So good. I think we mentioned that last time. We did. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to mention it again because I like that movie. Anyway. Uh, I haven't watched it in a while. I should watch it again. Anyway, Drew, your turn. Okay. <laughs> um, I mentioned this last time. It's coming soon. But uh, by the time this pen cast airs, we should have our new exclusive Bennu Euphoria pens available. Mm -hmm. uh, they are just lovely, delicious designs drink that you are going to want to eat, drink, consume. Yeah. But don't write with them and enjoy them. They're, we have caramel not latte, mm. rainbow slushy. And cookies and cream that looks just like cookies and that cream. Cookies and cream, people are getting excited about. Man, I'll tell but you. it's never done anything like that that no. I that I remember. And that was the one like we decided on last. We were like, we were we were really hesitant. We were like, oh yeah, definitely rainbow slushy, definitely caramel latte. But I'm like, ah, I don't know, it's kind of weird. But then the more we looked at, it, we're like, yeah. wait, hold on, I think they, this is awesome. They made us a prototype, and when we saw it, we were like, oh, that looks so much like cookies and cream. Like, well, we were about ringer. to say we were about to say no to it, and then Sam mm -hmm. was like, well, guys, hang on. I think I, people might like this. I think, I think cookies and cream is pretty cool. We're like, wait, really? And then we started talking about it. And then we just kind of like, it was like magic eye where it's like, oh, I don't know. And then like we saw it. We're like, oh, wait. Yeah. That is good. <laughs> anyway, that's going to be wow. available. Check them out. We're really magic excited eye, about it. That's a throwback them. there, man. Yeah. I don't know if everybody knows magic eye. I, I've mentioned it often because, you know, not to get too tangential, but I often mention it as a way the ADHD mind works because I talk mm. about how sometimes okay. you could be focused on focusing on something and it can be working but rather than your vision kind of blurring and letting you see the magic eye mm. your, your brain just kind of like wow <laughs> just kind of gets fuzzy you're still looking you're still focusing but yeah. you're kind of just looking through, through it. it so yeah. i use the magic eye analogy right. a lot fair enough but it's but it's completely without your permission where you're just yeah. like Oh, sorry. What? Oh, sorry, just magic eyed on you there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, so another Retro 51 popper has mm -hmm. been on the way, so this should be available as mm. of this posting. The Retro 51 Spooky Silhouette is now available. So we didn't pick up their Dragon USPS stamp version, but mm -hmm. it is out there available for you. This is kind of a, a successor to that with spooky-themed stamps, so very much mm -hmm. Halloween vibey. So... Um, that they, will be available through the Google Bank they Company. Do a, they do a good job with the Halloween-themed retros, I feel I like. I mean, it's not quite as amazing as Sleepy Hollow last year, but it is really Sleepy cool. Sleepy Hollow was sweet. And it has a really cool topper as well. This one's cool too, though. I it like does, it. It does, yeah. I really like it. Yeah. Um, so that's available. And also, today will be available the Estherbrook Oktoberfest Camden. And mm -hmm. this is a very lovely pen, very much themed of the season, hence the name. So this is the time to buy it. The month of October, ink it up with your favorite fall colors and enjoy as all of nature dies around you and you revel in its demise. Uh, but it comes back next year, so it's all right. So morbid, Drew. Yay! Cool. All right, we got lots of new stuff, so make sure, again, this is the time of year where things start coming out. Yes. Check out our new arrivals and coming soon stuff on our site. And here comes some Q&A right at you in your ears. Okay, you ready for number one? Are you ready for number one? That's the question. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this could be a deep dive, That's but I've I got, I've, got, I've got my fiddle coin I'm teetering, out, so I'm just going to... I'm teetering. No, you're not. You're this is, this is not the deep dive of the of the episode. Oh, it's not? No. Oh, God, Brian. No, anyway. it's the, the currency one is the deep dive. Oh, right. Gracious me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you're like, wait, All right. this isn't the deep dive? <laughs> I bring this upon myself. I love like, your I, reaction. I, I, you uh, pick these questions, I know. I, I don't know. You could make a deep dive out of anything, though, though. I can. It's like a gift. Though, though. It's like a gift. I Anyway, have. Brad <laughs> asks us, how do retailer exclusives benefit the manufacturer? Obviously, oh, it benefits who's selling it, but why would the manufacturer go out of their way to give a retailer an exclusive? It's a great question. Uh, funny enough, I've never like 
sat down with the manufacturer, any of the manufacturers, we've done of exclusives, a lot of different ones, never sat down and like bulleted out a list with them of like, what are all the benefits of doing retailer exclusives? Usually it's just retailers begging them to do exclusives because I think more of the clear benefit is to the retailer. Uh, and, you know, we'd like to have special things. And if we can be the only one that has it, there's, you know, a competitive advantage of yeah, sorts. That seems to be the obvious part. Yeah. And you think about most manufacturers, you know, if they're selling things to a certain region or, you know, usually they have some kind of distributorship set up, pretty much if they make something that's in the quantity that would be something that a single retailer could do, because there's usually some kind of minimum that they need to do just to have it make sense to go through all the, the production to do a single run of something. Um, usually a distributor can hit that pretty easy because they can sell to multiple retailers and, you know, it's a lot easier for a distributor to sell, you know, say it's whatever, 300 pens, 500 pens, whatever. It, it depends on the brand and, and the model and the price point, but, you know, it might be a whole bunch of pens like that. That can be tough for a retailer to hit, but a distributor, it, they can spread that around pretty easy because they might have 100, 500 different retailers, who knows? Um, so I think the benefit to the manufacturer is a little less clear there financially because they're basically going to sell the products either way, right? Um, so it's not as hard, fast, like universal as to what the benefits might be on the manufacturing side, but it was cool because I got to kind of get in that mentality a little bit um, and uh, think about what benefits they may have. So it's probably like, there's probably a couple of benefits that they may have, probably not all of them in every case, but you know, I'll talk through some of the ones that I think uh, could be there. Um, yeah, so uh, potentially higher benefit for the retailer, but it's also more risk on the retailer side as well. Mm -hmm. I won't get too deep into that because we're talking about the manufacturers. So some different uh, benefits. I broke it down in some, I don't know, kind of broader categories like uh, branding, you know, it excites the pen community to see new, fresh, interesting things coming out, especially if it's like limited things, special things, you know, brands of all different sizes, not even just in the pen world, but like Nike will come out with, you know, special edition, limited edition shoes and stuff like that. They might do it through a retailer, they might sell it direct, but that kind of stuff gets the enthusiasts in the community, the, the tastemakers, the trendsetters, gets them really excited about stuff and they will be excited, talk about the brand more and it's good just overall branding for the company. So. I think there's a, you know, it's it's less of a direct financial benefit maybe to the manufacturer, but it's good branding in terms of keeping their name out there in the community amongst the people who are most excited about the brand. Yeah, and I'm sure that in producing smaller batches for individual retailers, they can be mm -hmm. a little bit more tailored to specific interests rather yeah. than when they need to make a regular edition of something. Exactly. They kind of have to hit all interests. Yeah. But yeah. yet if they wanted to make a Jurassic Park Reebok, then okay, not going to make as many of them, but the people who are going to be into them are going to get super excited about it and exactly. talk a lot about it and post a lot about it and mm -hmm. get it out there. Yeah, exactly. So it shows, you know, that basically the manufacturer is being responsive to the community and they kind of do that through the retailer. The retailer is going to probably have more like boots on the ground, like, you know, interaction go directly with the community and they can really curate these like things that would feel really special in the community. So there's a nice nice pairing that can happen there when you're working direct with the manufacturer. Um, the retailer is going to do most of the promotion uh, when with an exclusive item. So if a manufacturer is trying to sell something globally or sell you know something in a much larger quantity, more evergreen product, they've got to do photography, they've got to write copy, they've got to do a whole lot more to kind of promote it. And they've got sales reps, they've got you know all kinds of things involved in like the overhead involved in distribution when going globally. Whereas when they're dealing direct with a retailer, that retailer Retailers highly motivated to do all the promotion because they're on the hook for all those yes. pens or whatever it is. So, you know, the manufacturer really doesn't have as much heavy lifting to do uh, from a branding and promotion side. Um, income wise, I think, you know, it kind of is a wash because uh, for the manufacturer, because they're probably going to sell anything they would make in like a retailer, you know, exclusive quantity. They could sell that to a distributor anyway. Um, but, you know, basically when a retailer orders something from a manufacturer in an exclusive relationship, we're committing to the full quantity of that production run. So the manufacturer's basically already sold it. So there's very low financial risk, you know, unless I guess the retailer defaulted, but that's probably not going to happen because one, you're going to be vetted pretty hard. You're, you're, you're not just giving like exclusive retailer stuff to anybody. It's going to be somebody who's pretty well established and has a good like record of credit and stuff like that. Um, you know, but there's also 
a huge incentive not to, you know, directly like screw over your manufacturer if you're a retailer with an exclusive. Like you're going to pay them right away, uh, you know, for that thing just to stay on good graces and stuff. So guaranteed income for the manufacturer, low financial risk there. Um, so that's good. Um, I also think just it's efficient. You know, the overhead is going to be very low for the manufacturer. They don't have to do as much of that, you know, kind of work like I already mentioned. Um, and just like the time and the logistics involved are very streamlined, you know, because it's just you're very you're dealing with, you know, basically one point of contact for the whole production run. As soon as you come up with the design, everything it's like, OK, boom. And you just that's all you're dealing with. Um, they don't have to take pictures. They don't have to do a lot of promotion, no advertising, sales staff, any of that stuff. The retailer is going to do all that. Um, and they can make smaller batches uh, of production and they can put it in their slower times. So the manufacturer, like typically when we are doing an exclusive with a manufacturer, we are, you know, having conversations that can go on sometimes for a long time, like a year or two or more, honestly, when it comes to some of these things. Um, so the manufacturer really is the one who sets what's the pricing going to be, what's the timeline going to be, the quantity, those types of things. And they're going to work it in. You know, they, they have seasonality just like any business might. But, you know, when you're in manufacturing of any kind, the number one thing you try to do is keep your operation running efficiently and running all the time, because that is going to be the most efficient way, you know, because it's all about just logistics and streamline of operations. So if they can have smaller production runs of things kind of like always in the works, then when they have, you know, ebb and flow of their regular product line that can tend to happen throughout the year, for example, you know, my more pens might sell around certain holidays, like the end of the years, or maybe you're on Father's Day, Mother's Day, graduations, back to school, that type of stuff. They can take the smaller exclusive retailer stuff and they can put that in like the middle of summer or whatever, whatever their downtime might be. And uh, they can keep their, their, um, you know, equipment operating, they keep their people uh, paid and happy and all that kind of stuff. So that can work out well to round out things from a, a manufacturer side. Um, and then uh, it's really just low risk, you know, so like they can use more speculative design or materials if they have some materials that they bought a lot of that they did years ago on one pen and they have, you know, a smaller stock of it left over, they can use that stock. So they might be able to get rid of some material that is just sitting around or, you know, they can work with a retailer like us who might source out some new crazy material that they never would have wanted to do themselves but we can take that risk and they can do something that's a little more out on a limb uh, and, you know, not have to worry about whether it's going to sell or worry about the feedback from, you know, distributor or a whole bunch of retailers. It's that one retailer that's kind of on the hook from all of it. So, um, you know, basically they're all sold from the start. So from the manuf manufacturer side, so it's really just, is this something that's going to like make sense from a branding standpoint for, for their product line? And then uh, that's pretty much it. So yeah, a lot, of, a lot of benefits, I think. I mean, that's that's most of them. I don't think that anybody, I don't think any manufacturer is like retiring off of, you know, retailer exclusives or anything. But I think the probably the biggest benefit, I think, is like either like the the production, like the smoothness of production to be able to round out the times and then just the, the you know, excitement in the community and the positive branding and like the just good relationship with some of their retailers, you know. That, that was going to be thing. the one thing I, I was yeah. going to add on is the relationship aspect. I mm -hmm. think that, I'm sure that most people know, but the fountain pen industry is a small one. And yeah, in the grand scheme of things. And yeah. we've worked with um, people in the manufacturer and in the vendor zone that have worked for one manufacturer and gone to a different manufacturer, mm -hmm. have worked for one distributor and gone to another distributor. Yeah. And relationships are very important. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's smart to say, all right, you know what? This retailer wants an exclusive. Mm -hmm. It's really no sweat off our back. Let's go ahead and do it. And then maybe mm -hmm. when this, you know, big bird pen that we just got licensed, you know, we spent, <laughs> you know, a quarter of a billion dollars licensing a big bird pen because Elmo is Elmo's you know. all the rage. Big bird needs some love. So let's yeah. go ahead and we, we've actually bought big bird. Now we're going to make all big bird pens. Hmm. We go to this retail and be like, hey, we gave you the exclusive last year. How about you order uh, at least two big bird pens, please? You know, <laughs> and they're like, all right, you know what? We did have that awesome exclusive. Give us your big bird. That's fine. <laughs> I grew up in the '80s. I, I, I respect Big Bird. Big Bird transcends generations. Big I don't Bird's know, man. It, this time. is a, this is an Elmo time now. Yeah. Big Bird is. I don't know. He and Snuffleupagus have gone. Snuffleupagus, go I feel like, is not uh, no, not he, transcended the generations. No, he is not. I don't think even think he had. No, he was never popular. Sorry. No, he no. was always like he's like the Eeyore of the <laughs> Sesame Street bunch. You know, <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> 
Anyway, yeah, there you go. So interesting points. If you have further, deeper questions about it, ask in the comments and be happy to answer more about it. But those are just some of the benefits that came top of mind for me. All right. Fantastic. Beth's big plans. Beth's got some big plans. All right, Beth. One of those plans is asking this question to Drew. Uh, how do you clean a custom 723, which I'm curious about, uh, or a Lamy 2000 if you cannot take them apart, Drew? I'm guessing she means the 823 because yeah, a 742 a, is very easily disassemblable. Um, the, yeah, 742 a, or 743. It's just a cartridge yeah, converter. It's a cartridge right? converter. So, so it's probably an 823 she's okay. mentioning. We'll just assume that it's the 823. Yeah, because both that and the 2000 are difficult to disassemble. Yeah. Um, so the 2000, that's an easier one. So I'll start off with that one. Yes, do not disassemble that pen. You will gnarly up the... Don't disassemble the piston. The piston. You yeah, can take you can the take, grip off. Yeah, and in fact, do take the grip off. Mm -hmm. Take the grip off. Clean out your feet. Don't lose the little metal ring. Oh, don't and, lose that. And extend that piston all the way to the back of the pen and just take an ink syringe, not an ink syringe, and a, a syringe that you have filled with water mm -hmm. and just blast the ever-living heck out of that barrel and you will be able to flush most of what you need out. And you'll see if yeah. it has any sort of color running out. Just blast it until it is all clear and honestly use a lot of force because whenever i've cleaned stuff you know a gentle like cartridges for example i clean out a lot of cartridges because i am yeah. i'm a refill the cartridge type of person right now you are you're a cartridge um, guy you're you're a syringe guy you you get that syringe I, out all the time i really do i love it it's my bread and butter yeah uh so yeah you the more you blast that thing the more you can get a 2000 nice and cleaned out so i mm. wouldn't worry too much about the 2000 just take the grip off blast the heck out of that um hmm. internal reservoir and you should be good to go um, and I, you can also get a uh, you can get a cotton swab up there too. And you can. You know, I was it, gonna say I got a different technique. But you got, you got, you got to kind of you got to squish it first. in there. You know. It, yeah. It, you know, but it. once you get in there, it, it's it's totally fine. Yeah. Or even like a baby bottle brush or something like that. As long as you're not you know hitting metal on anything, just use the bristles yeah. only. You can get up there. Mm -hmm. So that one's not as tricky. Once you get the grip section off, you get access to the reservoir, and you, you can, can use there, whatever yeah. you want to you know clean yeah. stuff out. The eight twenty three, however, you don't get that. Yeah. Um. So. In an ideal world, if you are looking to protect your warranty and to make sure that you can return your 823 to the place in which you bought it with no questions asked or no or, difficulties. Or send it to Pilot for their warranty. Right. Yeah. My suggestion as a retailer Don't touch is, that is to just use the vacuum operation until it's not inky anymore. Don't change the color very often. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And, and only and, and use it with colors you're already familiar with. Uh, it, it would be a bummer to have the 823 be your first pen and be like, all right, sure, let me try Organic Studios Nitrogen. I heard that's popular. Hmm. You're going to have a tough time with that one. You'd lose Bay State Blue. Let's put that in Yeah, there. so <laughs> hopefully you will have gone to the 823 after having a previous fountain pen and being able to know what ink is a little bit more difficult. I don't think that's most people's first pen. I don't think so. I don't Though think so. Though if you are, you're a baller. Yeah, yeah. I mean, straight, to, straight to the wind. You made a good choice. Yeah. Strong out the back. So I would say stick with an ink you bat. know is gentle and clean it often. Use it often. Um, I think the 823 is a great like often used pen because it's oh, got yeah. a good, it, it, it's I think reliable. I, comment, I commented about this last episode. Yeah. I was like, those who are using an 823 pretty much have them inked up and using them all the time. And I believe that the uh, person who we spoke to about uh, writing all of the Lord of the Rings books uh, yeah. used an, an 823 and a Collier. And so anyway. Yep, there you go. Um, that being said, do that first. Don't disassemble it. Mm -hmm. Just use the vacuum thing to clear it out. If mm -hmm. you want to know what can be done, mm -hmm. I can share a few of those things with you that I do not recommend. And mm -hmm. I'm going to list a few of these to you in the order of how greatly I will say don't do them. So okay. the first one is remove the nib and the feed. Uh, that is the lowest risk of the three I'm going to mention here. The friction fit feed and nib can pull right out and you will have access to the reservoir at that point from the entry point into the grip section. So yeah, you're you, not talking about unthreading the grip or anything. Absolutely you're not. You're talking about just whoop, yep. fr friction fit. They, they, they do remove pretty easily. Okay. Be careful, obviously. You can get a syringe in there and, mm -hmm. you know, flush out yeah. the reservoir that way. The nib and the feed, they they mate together in a particular they way. They do. They are keyed. But it's, so, pretty, it's pretty obvious yes. how it happens, but it doesn't have to fit in in any type of orientation. Right. Like the like Lamy pens, if you put that feed in the wrong way, you're going to screw some stuff up. Mm -hmm. But this one, as long as the nib and the feed are like locked in together, you can just... It's pretty hard to screw it up. Yes. Yeah, right. Just like that. Just yep. like that. So again, obviously, you know, don't touch it. You know, Pilot yeah. is not super happy about any sort of manipulation of their pens. So just keep that in mind. I mean, to be fair, you can do whatever you, you want. You can do whatever you want. Yes. And that's but why I'm telling you this. If you, know, you break something, these are, these are all things it. that can be done. 
Um, should be done, up to you. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. So the second most risky thing you can do is to remove the piston assembly in the back, the vacuum assembly. And mm -hmm. there is another brand that ha often has wrenches packaged with their pens to mm -hmm. disassemble piston units. Yeah. And, and rhymes with schmoisby. Yeah, rhymes with schmoisby. Mm -hmm. uh, this wrench can also fit the 823, and it can it unthread just fine. You will then have access mm -hmm. to, you know, a large access at the end of the barrel to clean your ink reservoir, and you'll also be able mm -hmm. to clean and maintain and grease if you'd like your vacuum fill mechanism. Mm -hmm. One could surmise it would also fit a Pelican M800 and M1000. Uh, someone might have tried that before. Oh, okay. Someone might definitely know that that works. Oh, okay, great. Do they have flat? It has two flat things? Yeah. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Um, so I hear that it's identical. Of course, of course. Yeah, and yes. you can We're literally all just use the same. Here. It's an eight millimeter wrench on the, right. uh, you know, rhymes with schmears me. Right. So now, um, and then the third most, oh, I thought the third. I was, a, I was feeling a little short. My oh, chair was go. down a little bit. Yeah, you were kind of low. I was kind of low. Right. I'm usually a little nice low anyway. Up here. Yeah, I got, I got a short torso, everybody, and Drew towers over me when we're sitting down. It's yeah. very humbling. Not when we're standing. We're about the same height standing. Um, and uh, so the most no, no thing I would recommend is to, what Brian alluded to earlier, remove the grip section. Mm. The grip section, the opaque part of the 823, if we're talking about the amber one, which is the most popular one in the US, mm -hmm. is glued in and threaded in. If you uh, break that glue and unthread it, it is, all, in, my, in my experience, it's almost a guarantee that your barrel will eventually crack. It yeah. might not crack the first time, might not crack the second time, but that is the most common issue that we get professionally here with 823s is someone yeah. who has cracked the barrel by unthreading and rethreading the grip yeah. section. Some people say like, hey, I've done it a bunch of times. It works fine for me. Other times it's, I actually did it. Now it's cracked, and it, but I did it for six months and it was fine. Other times you do it once and it cracks. It's not supposed to be done. Please don't do it. Yeah. They um, put a little thing in there, like a bright yellow card or whatever the heck in there being like, don't do this. You crazy yeah. person. And that also is the reason why I wouldn't recommend um, option two, uh, unthreading the grip section, because Pilot assembles this thing intelligently, but it is prone to cracking if you mess with it. So the yeah. cracking can happen during the process of removing the grip section, or it can happen in over tightening the piston assembly. If you do use yeah. a wrench and you wrench it down even a yeah. little bit too tight, you can crack the back mm -hmm. end as well. Yeah. It, it's very, very rare to have a Pilot 823 that you never do either of those things with crack. It really only cracks right. when you start manipulating it in ways it. Pilot doesn't recommend. I've seen yeah. it uh, almost exclusively mm -hmm. happen that way. Yeah. Theoretically, someone I know may have you know disassembled their 823 from the back end quite a bit and never had a problem. It can be done, mm -hmm. but you know, again, I know if, someone else. If that, something just, happens. Yeah then you're on your own because you did something they didn't they didn't want you to. Yep. Um, now, if your 823 uh, or whatever pen was purchased secondhand, you don't really have a warranty anyway. So, um, mm. like, you cannot really provide anybody with a proof of purchase that would be warrantied. So mm. you can kind of do whatever you want at that point, you know. But still, we want to protect your pen, not just your warranty. So this is coming from, you know, customer care perspective of things that we've seen go wrong. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, overall, I would say removing the nib and feed is probably the most safe option if you are bound and determined to clean your vacuum filling 823 or whatever in a non-vacuum filling way. Yeah, you have I anything agree. To add to that? I got nothing to add to that. All right. Yeah, it's too nice of a pen to just really mess around with, you know, yep. why risk it? All right, well, moving on. We've got a question from James. And James mm -hmm. is asking a very different sort of question, but yeah. also pretty relevant, all things considered. Deep as we were just dive fodder. <laughs> Love it. Give it James, to me. James, why'd you do this? Give it all to right. me. All right. James says, I note the yen is down against the dollar by 20% this year. Mm. Will we see sale prices on Japanese pens in the future? And James was not the first mm. person to ask this, Brian. I did see a couple people oh, yeah, on Instagram it's, also. Um, and this long. goes with uh, James yeah. actually shot us a follow-up email mentioning that uh, the euro in Italy um, yeah. uh, is in a similar situation as well. Yes. Obviously, there the are a lot of... Uh, yeah, it's less about them being down. It's more about the dollar being up. So pretty much most... Uh, there's, there's a lot of people that are dealing with this right yeah. now. 
And we've got a lot um, of fountain pens from Italy and Japan. And mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. So what is the um, deal with that? Yeah. So How this many is a pages, Brian. This is a. <laughs> oh my God. I thought it was a deep dive. I mean, I kind of like typed it like. I was, like I was talking. So it's, I mean, they're bullet points, but I can basically just read it. Uh, so I will say, okay, to answer your question first, kind of the TLDR version, uh, will you see prices on Japanese pens in the future, it, it, you know, drop or go on sale? It's possible, but I wouldn't necessarily bet on it right now. Um, there's a lot of factors when it comes to the retail price of any product. And some of this will be like kind of specific to the pen industry, but it's really a, it's much broader question than that because this is, I mean, when you're talking about currency and exchange rates and all that, this impacts like the global economy as a whole. And fountain pens are just one tiny, tiny little part of that. So it's more like, yeah, the fountain pen industry will be affected, but in a similar way that almost any goods that's manufactured, you know, and imported are gonna be as well. Um, so a lot of different things going on. Currency conversion rates, really just one factor. Um, Part of the benefit of having a chain of distribution that we have is that there's um, some pricing stability that can be introduced in the market. So otherwise, if you were having to buy more directly from, you know, say other countries with different currency and stuff like that, you would be seeing a lot more volatility in pricing on a regular basis. Kind of like the stock market. If you look at what happens on a daily basis, it's like, woo, 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 woo. it's all over the place. Well, when you, you know, for example, are buying, say, like an index fund or something that's, you know, you have a mediator somewhere in between there, you get a little bit more stability and you're not having to ride the wave up and down as a consumer. Because think about it, if you were doing that, not just in fountain pen world, but in everything that you went to buy, how in the world would you budget for anything? If you went to the grocery store and the price for anything could be up or down 50 or 100% on any given day, it would be absolutely maddening. I mean, it kind of felt like that earlier this year. Well, we've had some inflation <laughs> and stuff like that. That's a whole other thing. And I'm gonna say all this, like I am not an economist. I, you know, am a business person and I read some things and I have a general awareness of these things, but, you know, by no means am I like the most qualified person to talk about this, but I'm hoping I can kind of fake it like I did with the acrylic thing and maybe somebody else like Dan will back me up <laughs> in the economy side of things. Um, so we'll see. So all that grain of salt, you know, but I have, I guess some perspective on it because I am in this industry a little bit. Um, anyway, so you'll see a lot of volatility if you're buying like direct like that. So by having, for example, if we have a manufacturer, let's say they're in Japan, by your example, you know, Pilot as an example. So Pilot is in Japan, they're manufacturing things, they're using raw materials, which by the way, a lot of raw material and commodities are pegged to the US dollar, which affects things, you know, in its own crazy way, because a lot of commodities, when the dollar is stronger, well, now everybody's manufacturing is paying more for the raw goods and stuff. And so that affects things. Um, anyway, so um, you have Pilot USA, who's the US pilot distributor. So everything that comes into the Pilot US is coming through Pilot USA. Well, they are housing inventory and they're placing orders for things kind of throughout the year. And they are making it so that we as a retailer buying from them, we can have a predictable price that's there for six months, nine months, a year, maybe more. Um, and it's not volatile and changing all the time because when we go to promote something, it's really, really helpful to be able to say this pen costs this much money and not have that change all the freaking time. So there's a lot of benefits to doing it that way, but definitely on the manufacturing and like distributor side, they're absorbing a lot of that volatility on a regular basis. So that's uh, one reason that maybe you don't see things drop as quickly is because you also don't see things rise as quickly, which I'm gonna kind of get to next. Um, so one of the things I that, uh, sorry, one reason that I don't think that price drops or a guarantee, kind of like what you're you're asking about, um, is because a lot of distributors, and specifically to like where we are right now, a lot of distributors distributors have already felt the squeeze with increased shipping prices in the last year or two. And oh, I mean, it's crazy, kind of crazy. And a lot of them have absorbed that without raising prices. Massive increases. Yeah. So cargo freight, just as an example, um, if you're importing, say, a 40 foot cargo container, prior to COVID, might have cost you two thousand dollars coming from Asia. You know, just as an example, I talked to, we don't do a lot, we don't import stuff by the container load here because we're not, we're buying stuff more through US distributors, but distributors are buying stuff by container load. And certainly in other industries, I know a lot of other e-commerce retailers who are buying things more directly. And so I've talked to a lot of different people about like shipping container prices. Um, so 
for example, a 40 foot container might have cost $2,000 to get to the US from Asia, you know, two years ago. Um, and the most that I heard of somebody paying for was I think $43,000, like having $30,000, $40,000 per container. I mean, you're talking like 10 to 15 to 20 X price increase. And they have to pay it. And yeah, you have they no don't choice. have a choice. It's like, like you pay it or you don't get your products. Or you give up on your business. Yeah. Cause like if there's no have, air freight alternative. If you have no products yeah. to sell, what are you doing? Like, yeah, they, I mean, it's. Th this is like an unprecedented time with COVID with the whole shipping stuff. And it's it's gotten a little better this year, but it's still way above where it was pre-COVID. And that's a point that often doesn't come up when we are asked, well, why do you have distributors? Why don't you just buy direct? And this price absorption yeah. aspect that you're mentioning mm -hmm. is a very real asset to having distributors because they do absorb a ton of fluctuation in that regard mm -hmm. that, yeah. that then we would then have to absorb yeah. or the manufacturer or who knows that's it's, it could get messy that's like a whole leg on the trail <laughs> that i'm not going to go down but that is a great Thank point you. that is a great point um uh, also higher interest rates like the u.s interest rates have gone up quite a bit this year uh, and so that means that for importers to buy and hold the stock you know they oftentimes will have to commit to buying something from a manufacturer up front that's one thing you don't realize a distributor might be doing. You know, when you buy something like you just, it's just there on the shelf and you're ready to buy at any time. You know, you don't have to commit to it until you, you know, purchase it and get it in your hands. A lot of times with distributors though, they may have to buy things three months, six months, a year ahead of time, you know, because the manufacturer needs their money to like actually produce the stuff and they don't want to be left holding the bag. Um, so distributors a lot of times have, you know, very clear, clear, like contractual relationships, you know, there's benefits, they get the exclusivity, you know, maybe of having that product, you know, that brand in the U S and they're the only ones that can sell it, but they're also helping the manufacturer out by fronting a lot of that cash, you know, giving the manufacturer some stability. Um, and so that's, uh, that's one thing that can make a big difference. Like higher interest rates here in the U S mean that if a distributor is having to finance their inventory because they don't have the product yet to sell, you know, we, as a retailer, we're not going to buy something way in advance from a distributor if we don't have to, you know, and so, um, they're, they're floating all that. And when the interest rates are higher, that debt costs more and that uh, is is more expensive for the for the distributor. So they got to make that up somehow. So there's a lot that's really been squeezing um, kind of parts of the distribution chain that you may not see or realize that much. Um, so all that stuff is thrown into the the mixing bowl of things that you know come out in retail prices so yes currency exchange rates can be of some benefit but then you have higher shipping costs and some of these other things and if things get way out of whack then yeah price changes can happen but a lot of times you know one thing is way off and another thing is way more expensive you don't realize and all kind of mixes together and, and has some level of stability there um so uh, uh, also, you know, because they're having to buy things so far ahead of time, you know, manufa or a, a distributor might've paid for something six months ago or nine months ago. And now the drop in currency prices, that's only on like future orders that they're gonna be placing. That's not affecting what's on the shelves right now. So these types of currency exchange rate type things, unless it's like more like the raw manufacturer, you know, or like raw material to the manufacturing kind of thing, those are a little closer relationship. Uh, but at the time you're buying something in retail in the store, you know, that the, the, those are using commodities that were purchased like probably two years ago. And then the manufacturer made it and then the distributor ordered it and then it's the retailers get it. And so it's like, you're you're way down the chain at this two point. Two years. Oh, easily. Wow. Yeah. yeah, by the time, I mean, you think about like the raw like ore that's mined for gold to make the nibs. Like how long ago was that gold probably mined? Like, who knows, it could be years ago. So, you know, it's, it's like the, the prices of these things it's not like as closely related, yeah. you know, by the time you're talking like retail prices. And also like if you're talking gold versus plastics versus, you know, aluminum, you know, those are all, those could all have been acquired at three completely different yeah. market environments. Absolutely. Not only, yeah, exactly. And you can have all kinds of things because those are, you get commodities exchanges and stuff like that too. Now you're getting on like speculative purchases on top of the actual real pricing of the commodity. That's Ugh. a whole other thing. <laughs> that we're not gonna dive down. Um, but basically the importer, which is usually a distributor in most of the aspects of the pen world, uh, because most fountain pen and, and just pen retailers in general 
are not very big. You know, you get like a major retailer for other industries. You think about like an Amazon or a Target or Walmart or something like that. That's a retailer that has real buying power. They can buy containers and containers. They can buy like shiploads of stuff direct because they're big enough as a retailer. Um, most retailers in the fountain pen world, I mean, us, if, if you consider us one of the bigger ones, which I, I would guess we are maybe, but like we're not buying stuff by the container load. Like we're still buying relatively small amounts of all this stuff. So um, you usually have some importer, some distributor that's that's dealing with all this kind of global shipping and transit and currency stuff. Um, their prices are fluctuating on a per order basis. So that's one thing that gets kind of crazy um, that distributors are, you know, helping insulate us from as retailers and certainly you as customers. Like literally every order they place because it is tied to the exchange rates, it might be up, it might be down, and it fluctuates every time they place an order. So most, I think, distributors are placing orders every few weeks or once a month, maybe once every six weeks, somewhere around there. And it's all pegged to the exchange rates. And sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. And, you know, they can have different, um, like, negotiated contractual kind of stuff in there where it might be pegged to, you know, the U.S. dollar. It might be pegged to the currency of wherever the manufacturer might be if they're not in the U.S. You know, it might be averaged out somehow they may you know they work out something so that basically no one is left like just totally screwed like you don't want the manufacturer to get totally screwed because then they're not going to make the products anymore you don't want the distributor to get totally screwed because then you know the manufacturer is going to just totally miss out on an entire huge market like the u.s potentially so you want it to be somewhat favorable but you know sometimes it's up and sometimes it's down so you know these fluctuations will kind of even themselves out a little bit over time and so yeah okay the exchange rate's really wacky now but six months from now it might be in a totally different situation. So the pricing at the retail level doesn't change as closely to what's happening at like that deep end because that would just be really chaotic and, and, and difficult for everybody because it might swing back six months from now. Um, let's see here. Exchange rates can swing pretty drastically and very quickly. So distributors act as kind of a buffer. That's helpful, blah, blah, blah. I've covered a lot of that. Um, let's see here. And uh, yeah, manufacturers are running businesses too. And when their currency drops, they're less incentivized to ship orders in full. So if they're sitting on a bunch of inventory, you know, they might try to time it so that things can balance out a little bit. Oh. I mean, think about it. Mm. If you know, like it's 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 kind of common sense. Like if you can if you only have so much of a production capacity and you've got inventory and you know that the currency's dropped quite a bit pretty drastically. Are you going to be incentivized to just like ship all that stuff out? You know, the U.S., for example, like say, I don't know, say you don't have a any type of agreement between a, a manufacturer in, you know, in this example, Japan, and a distributor in the U.S. Well, the distributor may be like, oh, the exchange rate is very favorable for the U.S. right now. I want to stock up and get a whole bunch more because I'm essentially getting a discount. And then, you know, I'll buy six months or a year's worth of inventory if the manufacturer has it. And then I can just hang on to it and I can use that to help float some potential future risk when things swing the other way, because mm. that will probably happen. That would, that would be a so, smart move. Yeah, but. so smart on their part, but then the manufacturer right. might say, wait a minute, we're gonna empty no. our entire warehouse <laughs> and you know, basically not have any profit or maybe even lose money because of the exchange rate. Well, that's not a good business decision. So they may, and I'm not saying this happens like specifically with any one retailer or Japan or anything like that. This is just the example we're going with, but there certainly is a business case to be made that a manufacturer would be less incentivized to ship out just everything in full when it's a extremely less favorable exchange rate situation. So there's a lot of nuance to this, but that is certainly something that they are thinking about and calculating quite a bit and would make total sense and be very understandable if they, you know, made a decision to to not ship as much when the exchange rates really, really dropped a lot. Um, and then just wait, or, you know, they could even have something in the contract, like if the exchange rate drops, you know, over a certain amount, very unfavorably, maybe there's some kind of thing that they can work out to equalize it a little bit. And, you know, they could, they could build that on both ends. That would be a, I think that would be a smarter way to go about it with like a distributor and, and manufacturer relationship. But, you know, again, I don't, I don't have any insights into any like actual contractual relationship information between any of the brands that we carry and their distributors. But I just know from talking to other people who, you know, deal in other industries that that's not an uncommon thing um, to have happened. So, um, yeah, long story short, it's just very complicated. And currency exchange 
affects all imports and exports, uh, not just pens. Uh, but what will affect retail prices the most will be kind of the sum total of all costs to distributors and retailers, but mostly it's going to be like market supply and demand at the end of the day. Like uh, we saw this with COVID, you know, like there was much, much less supply. Shipping costs were crazy. It was hard to get it. Demand was higher. Prices had to go up. It just made sense to do so. And if you see a drastic demand drop, then you're probably going to see some things go on sale. But you'll probably see not an actual like adjustment down of a manufacturer suggested retail price, but you're probably going to see things just put on sale and sold at a discount. Um, you're probably seeing that in other industries. If you look at, you know, like, you know, Target and other stores like that, Home Depot has got a ton of sales going on right now, which I may or may not have taken advantage of some like an hour before we did this pen cast over my lunch break. I was like, oh, dang, they got this like, you know, thing with like free batteries and all this extra stuff at like, I think I was like 63% off of like a Milwaukee, whatever, like multi-tool thing with like extra batteries and all that. And I was like 63% off, like dang on, man. Anyway, I need so, a circular, so. no affiliation. Go check it out, man. Mm. They got some deals. All they right. got some deals. But anyway, right. so it's complicated. But, you know, I would say that you you might see some some price drops um, on like a sale basis, but probably not an MSRP type, MSRP type thing. But in the end, the fountain pen industry, it's not a lot of like price gougers and really greedy folks in here. It's largely my my experience has been it's largely like family run businesses yeah. or multi-generational things or just people that are really conscious that they do, they really are in this industry kind of out of love and they do what they have to. And oftentimes our distributors are like, we're trying so hard not to raise prices and they will do it kind of to a breaking point. They're like, the numbers just don't work now. We have to raise prices. Whenever it's happened, it's happened because they absolutely had to. Yeah. So they do, they really do do a lot and it's a, a pretty thankless aspect of the industry, um, you know, in general, but it's something that's really important and we all have to, you know, take that into account. But it's a very fascinating subject and the whole macroeconomics of exchange rates and all that gets pretty complicated. There's lots of great YouTube videos out about them that I enjoy watching sometimes, but you know, uh, yeah, that's my perspective on it. So hopefully I don't totally like- No, that was interesting. Did it make sense? Yeah. Okay. That was interesting. Okay. It's just I, different perspective I that, that I don't normally uh, put my yeah. brain into. It's so complex, man. Like just- That was definitely conveyed. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just, and that's not even talking about the actual like making of a thing. That's just the like- how yeah. to get it here. There's a like, whole lot going on. It's just when you look at like the history and technology and economics and everything it takes to like have a fountain pen arrive in your hands, it's kind of unbelievable everything that's gone into making that object. So I don't know. The more I like spend time in and learn about those stuff, I'm just like, that's why I deep dive on everything because I'm like, there's so much here. I just know so much about so many things or maybe I think I know, but. Well, you do it for a time. No, it's what you remember that is questionable. That's yeah. how I, like I, I'll deep dive on something and I'll feel so smart about learning it and then I won't remember then you kind of forget it later. Yeah. But as long as I remember enough of it to know how to go back and find it again yeah, if I that's need true. it. That's, that's, yeah. that's all I'm going for. That's a good point. You know, yeah. so I'm like, yeah, okay, I know I did a video on that sometime. Let me go back and watch it and like, oh yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, that's right. And I like re-remember re it. Anyway. All right. That's enough of me. All right. Drew time. All right, bring it on. Deep dive? No. No. Have you ever done a deep dive? You've like dabbled. You've dabbled. I don't know. All right. Well, this is not one of those. John asks, favorite clips? Least favorite clips. I once saw a clip of a monkey sitting in a tree. Oh. And, wait, hold on. No, no. Sorry. We're talking about fountain pens. Oh. Um, fountain pen clips. Well, that changes my answer. Any of this. <laughs> I was going to say, like, baby monkey riding on a pig. Remember that one? <laughs> yes. The internet Same moment there. One. All right. So Visconti and Penider come to mind first because they have this uh, cool one-handed operation. You can just pinch the clip, hmm. pull it out like this, and slide it into any any pocket. And they yeah. both, they're spring-loaded, so they open up quite a bit. And when you pull them out, none of them, neither of them have, like, a little notch, a knob, like, you know, hook, nothing that will grab or catch on, which might be a detractor for some people. It's mm -hmm. not for me. I don't... I just need it to stay put for the time being. I'm not no. going to be doing cartwheels or anything. So those come to mind first because they're spring-loaded, which I like. They're one-handed, which I really like. They don't take a lot of effort, but they do their job um, nicely. The 2000 also one-handed. You can take the back end, and it's spring-loaded, so you can just press the back end of the clip. It pops up, put it in, let go. Mm -hmm. I love one-handed clip operations. I hmm. really, really do. So that that okay. just is uh, it's easy. It's fun. Um, 
from a functional standpoint, I like that. And from a visual standpoint, the first pen that popped into my head when I read this question hmm. was the Platinum President. Ooh, it has that, that art, like art deco. deco. Yes. Because yeah. mm -hmm. I love that nib too so much. I yeah, love that's the, a great nib. That that whole the aesthetic of the president. I, I just I wish they made more presidents. I love that. I like mm. it way better than the 3776. Mm. Uh that one aesthetically came to mind. I love the look of the president clap. You heard clap, it here. Clap. Drew hates the 3776. So. No, I just I think that go ahead and spread that around. Compared that's, to the president, uh, I think it is less unique. I think the 3776 looks like a lot of other pens in there. It kind of like it gets lost between the sailors and the Mont Blancs and the pilots. I think that the president mm. just has a little bit more of a definitive. It's got a presence about it. It does. It yeah. does. Yeah, I agree. So I, I think that they, I, I would like for them to lean more into that. But I anyway, agree. I also like functionally going back to functional now, mm -hmm. an upturned clip. It's hmm. so like the pilot Falcon has that arc to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that makes it slide onto things really easily because mm. it upturns right there at yeah. the end. Yeah. And the um, uh, Safari also does that. Oh, the Safari's the, got that very drastically. Now, yeah. I don't I don't love that clip because it is really huge. And the when paper you, clip clip? When you put it, <laughs> I don't mind the look of it. I really don't. I know yeah. a lot of people take Some issue people with that. Some people don't like it, but that's... I don't like I don't mind how big it is just because when you put it in pen cases, you always have to worry about Safaris because when you close the case, yeah. you're like, oh, why is this? Oh, it's because the Safari's in there. It always mm. makes it a little bit more bulky, so you kind of have to like yeah, try to turn like, it to the, the side. The upturn goes up so much. It really does. And it's really wide, too. Yeah. So like whatever, whatever, if you put it on like a, a piece of paper or like inside a journal, it's going to like wrap it around and you're going to yes. get like an indentation yeah. from that clip. So it's super functional it. from yeah. just grabbing onto things easily. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. you're looking for a very functional clip, absolutely it does it. But yeah. it's just a it's just really bulky and cumbersome. So like in cases and stuff, I don't love it. Okay. Um, but functionally, yes, the Falcon and the Safari come to mind because it upturns like that. Are you clipping? Like, how are you using the clips? Is it mostly in pen cases? Is pen it like in journals? Are you using it in shirt pocket? Like where, where um, are you? Sometimes shirt pocket, mostly pen cases, and then probably journals second. Um, okay. okay. So uh, every now and then, I will, I'll, clip a, I'll clip a retro 51 inside my jeans pockets. Okay. Um, They've keep, got an upturned clip on that too. It's a little bit. Slightly, yeah, it's slightly upturned. Bit. It would be it would be really handy for paper, not so handy for jeans because jeans it, are like a special case. Super That's thick. kind of an extreme. That, you instance. need a safari for that. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, yeah, I know I do like the I do like the retro fifty one. Okay. Now speaking of upturned clips, the Twisby Swipe has an upturned clip, and does it so though? To me, oh, it's upturned. Yeah. It it to me, it's like a. It's more like a a rest stop. Right, no, no, exactly. <laughs> the clip really itself cool. is useless, but it does upturn. So sure. it's, it's inviting. It says, yeah. come on, clip something on me. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, don't. No, you can use that like ribbon dental floss. Like maybe that's Maybe. Stuff. Not the regular dental floss, but like maybe. the ribbon type might fit on it. The Twisby swipe clip is like someone who leaves a message on their uh, voicemail that's mm. like, hello? I'm just kidding. Leave a message. Like you're like, oh, that's what the Twisby swipe clip. It's like, Hey, you want to clip something? Look, I'm upturned. Bring it on. Oh, no. Just kidding. I don't work. Mm, it's the clip equivalent of trolling somebody. It really is. Like, yeah. It really is. And the thing that sucks is I love that pen so much. You know I, I know. do. Yeah. So it's like it's so close. More than makes sense, really. It's so close to being perfect. But that thing, it's like, it, it's just like, mm, so true. close to nothing true is, awesome. Nothing is perfect. I know. Nothing is perfect. I know. Um, <laughs> so I, I do take issue with the, uh, as far as least favorite clips go, the Twisby swipe comes to mind. Yeah. And also... I don't love Pilot's lumpy ball clips. Really? I don't. I think they look, I, I think they take away from the pens. I think they're just kind like of- aesthetically you don't like it? They're just bulbous. And hmm. those pens are nice and sleek usually. Hmm. And the that obnoxious ball just, why 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 does it need to be on top? Why If you want a ball, do it on the bottom. Because I do understand the benefit of a nice smooth entryway, that that scoop. I see how that could help, the, help it glide onto- things it's clipping on but why does it need to be a giant orb like it's just you know i think it just looks it looks lumpy and <laughs> just uh that's a lumpy it's just a ball it's a it's, it's a, a lump. it ball. is literally a lump brian it's one lump it's one lump on an otherwise sleek polished japanese pen i just don't think it belongs it's I a don't. sleek polished ball <laughs> It's a sleek lump. It's a polished lump, yes. <laughs> but then they also have sometimes that that sword clip that you'll see on the 912. Like that, I like. That's a cooler clip. I like. Why that do a they lot. have to go back to the ball? Like, I don't, this is different. You know. Nah. Mm -mm. You Get know, from like when we were designing some pens, with like, when we were designing some exclusives with Edison back in the day, Brian Gray would send us like a box of random clips. Yeah. And it's really hard to pick a good clip. 
Yeah. It's really hard. It's harder than you'd think. It is, but you don't need a ball. Down with the ball. All right, Drew's, Boo, Drew's not ball. down with the ball. Now, Drew, you left one off here. I think I know what your favorite clip should be, at least. Do tell. We just looked at it last week in the video. The chaos. The sword oh. with the snake wrapped around it. Like That is a pretty cool clip. Um, what's cooler than that? Sorry, Drew. What's cooler than a giant sword? The pirate pen also has a giant sword, but at the top, it's a... Oh, the pirate pen. That's what I was it's, thinking it's of. Coming, Sorry. Oh, yeah, no, they're the both chaos. swords. They're both swords. Okay. But one is a fist holding a wing sword. Oh, and yeah, And then the yeah, pirate yeah. has like... No, the pirate's better. The it's pirate's, like, it's pirate's got, better. The sword's like coming out of its top out of the, jaw. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one. That that's one. That's what I was thinking. Oh, yeah. Chaos. For sure. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking more about like, you know, styles of clip, I guess. But yeah, one-offs <laughs> like that, you betcha, for sure. There's some. There's some like the TCB clip on the Elvis pen. That's my favorite clip ever, oh, obviously. Like, you, you know I feel, how I feel about TCB. I know. Like, yeah. that is... Yeah. <laughs> I said that to Archer the other day. He was like, oh, thanks for doing that. I was like, yeah, TCB, baby. He's like, huh? I was like, taking care of business. <laughs> he just looked at me like I was insane. Like, what do you... Well, what? Okay, dude. Like, rightfully so, probably. I was very proud of myself. I don't know what I did, but whatever. Yeah, so I don't All know. Right. What do you think? Um. Yeah, I, you know, in general, yeah, I agree with you. For me, clips are never like a total deal breaker. Like a clip would have to be really off for me to like not want the pen just because yeah. of the clip. No, they're never a deal like breaker. I, I guess I sort of have my preferences. So I actually had to think about this a little bit because I don't know. I guess most of like most of my experience has been like not falling in love with a pen and then like analyzing it based on the stuff. Most of it's been like, you know, looking at the pen as a whole and then just like more after the fact kind of thinking about the clip. So I don't know. I don't clip my pens to a lot of things. Mostly it's in pen cases. Um, just the type of clothing that I tend to wear. You know, I'm a big guy. My weight fluctuates quite a bit. So I'm not often wearing like tailored shirts with pockets and stuff like that. Most, I mean, I'm, today I'm wearing a hoodie, which I'm taking a risk because we've talked about my body, and you're still wearing my body heat regulation in here. But it's getting colder outside. That's true. But I don't know. It's like 41 when we woke up this morning in Fahrenheit. Oh, and it's like 73. So like I'm going to come in really cold, but then I'm going to leave the yeah. office and I'm going to be like, oh, uh, I'm yeah. sweating so much going to my car. Yeah, so. I, did, I ditched my hoodie <laughs> on my lunch break. Yeah, I'm I'm borderline right now. But I think I'm, I, I think I'll think I'll stick it out. All right. Uh, but anyway, where was I going with that? I totally lost my own train of thought. You don't use clips on clothing. Yeah, just, just in case. It's the type of clothing that I typically wear. Like I keep a, I keep a pocket knife like in my my pocket here, but then I'm like always getting my phone out of this pocket and keys and stuff. Like, I don't know, to me, like the the shorts pockets with the pen actually clipped into it is just so risky. Like the pen's going to get beat up pretty good. Yeah, I when I, on, on my person, I generally, if I have a breast pocket, I might do a pen yeah, there I, because that, that doesn't move a whole lot. Anything on my legs, like yeah. you could smash into things. I'm more of a creature of habit in that way. So it's like, if I don't, if I don't, have a regular pocket that I can put things in, then even if I do wear a shirt with a pocket, I'm not going to naturally think to put a pen in it. I'm just going to have a pen in. Like, usually I'll keep it in a sleeve, which then the clip doesn't matter at all, mm -hmm. and just keep that in my pocket. Or I have it in a pen case, and then clip is, you know, sort of helpful, but kind of optional. you can put a whole pen case in your cargo shorts. I can. I've done that before. You know I could. Or you can put it in your fanny pack, you know? Um, yeah, so, like, to me, clips are more of a, I don't know, it's it's less of a deal breaker kind of a thing. Uh, it's more of an aesthetic and more of a tactile thing. Like, when I'm writing with the pen, if I post it or something, you know, is that clip going to be in the way or, you know, just in the handling of the pen, is a clip pleasant to see and touch and that kind of a thing? Um, so, you know, generally speaking, I like a hearty clip. You know, no flim flam, floozy, like half baked. I don't really want to be attached to this pen kind of a clip. You know, just like I hate clips that are really weak and then you like go to use it and it bends and all that. I'm just like, this is just unacceptable. Yeah. You know, I want to, I want a clip that's like, don't want this really, going to be wobbling back and forth. Yeah. yeah. I just, no, I want a clip that's like really committed. How do you feel about the studio clip? The studio clip is committed to that pen. It is, but it does wobble a little bit. Uh, yeah. And it's like aesthetically, it's kind of, it's, it's unique. I think it's distinctive to the pen. It is distinctive to the pen. I've never it, had it wobble on any of my pens, but I, yeah, I don't, I'm it, not clipping it all that much. I've seen much. it scratch up the surface of pens oh, with, it, with its wobble. Okay, yeah, I can see that because it's really kind of like sharp at the point that it... And the pen itself, usually, not always, yeah. it, it can have that matte coating. Yeah, that and it's a, long, it's a long clip too, so it's got some... Yeah. yeah, that's true. I mean, I don't hate it, but it's not like, I wish this clip was on everything you know it's like to me it's just like oh that's the clip on the studio yeah you know um Lamy 2000 very functional clip kind of mm -hmm. like you mentioned only thing i don't like about the Lamy 2000 clip let me be a little critical for a second <laughs> on Lamy 2000 it's really sharp 
Like the it edges is, of the clip is is kind of sharp. It is very sharp, especially the top corners. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. So it's like when you are like kind of pressing it to try mm -hmm. to open up a little bit, you're like you're pressing into the corners of that thing. Mm -hmm. It's not so bad. Like these are like champagne problems, right? Sure, sure. sure. But um, you know, I would be interested. I'd be interested to see like a little bit of a chamfer, just a little, just a little light chamfer around the edges of that Miami well, 2000. Well, they're not changing know. anything at this point. They're not going to change it. <laughs> you know, they're definitely not going to change on account of me. But you know, that'd be kind of cool. You know what? That would be a cool thing to if I wanted to modify a Lamy 2000. I could put a chamfer on the edge of that clip. You could. That'd be kind of fun. Franken pen, my Lamy 2000. Mm. And then you try to operate it with one hand, realize it just slips right off, and you're like, no. No, you'd still get no, just a light, my 2000. a light chamfer injury, just a little bit, just enough to take the edge off. You know, it's like when you build a piece of furniture, and it's like you have wood. Wood is sharp. You can actually like cut yourself on the edge of wood if you like just leave that sharp edge. It's like a little bit of sandpaper, just like round that edge over a little bit, and you're like, hmm. Yeah, that's what I want. You know, you put your elbow on it and then it's not like scratching up your, you know. Yeah, that's what you got to do. Anyway, where am I going with this? Which clips um, do you like? What clips do I like? Yeah. Um, so for me, I, you know, spring clips versus tension clips is one thing that I do notice quite a bit and really think about a lot. Mm -hmm. So again, it comes down to hardiness. I. I don't like a really weak tension clip that like is just gonna bend and be really awful, you know? Uh, I don't like a clip that's super hard to to maneuver either and is gonna be like, you know, you have to like use two hands to like pull the thing out of your pocket. Yeah. Cause there are some, I, I can't recall any specifically in, in mind right now, but there's definitely some that like the clip is so like stiff and strong that it's actually like work to to get it especially on, into your pocket. Do you remember the like Karis Customs not. clips? Yeah. Those, those were, were brutal. Kind of like that. The yeah. one on the ink. Like yeah. if you got that thing on something, it was staying on there. Yeah. So like that kind of stuff. Not yeah. as crazy about they that. They are very hardy. Yeah, but that's very, like too but, much. So it's yeah. gotta be somewhere in the middle there. Um but I generally I like I like spring clips, you know, because I'm not like like what? Uh like Lamy two thousand is a really good one. Um the uh see I'm like failing to even remember specific ones. I even tried to, but um, I don't know. That's the only one that I can really think of specifically right now. CP1. CP1 has got a good clip. Yeah. It's got a yeah. good clip. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like the pen, but <gasps> the clip is good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like the Twisby 580 clip. I like that one. Yeah. You know, it's because it's That's like a tension clip. A it's a tension clip, but it's not so hard. It, it like strikes that balance really good. It does. It's nice and, and bouncy. Aesthetically, it just looks really good. Yeah. It just fits the pen really, really nicely. You know, it's kind of like kind of that like tapered on kind of both sides. And then it's got that like taper on the end Very too. It's nice and rounded. So like tactile wise, it feels really good. So that I really like that pen, not because the clip itself is like so crazy or flashy, but it just, it fits the pen really, really well. It does better than the uh, um, 700 fits the pen. Yeah, that clip is something. It's out of place. Eh, it's fine. Um, the wheel clips, the quip, like the the deltas that have like the the actual wheel on the end. And Monte instead of, has instead a of the few ball. Of those too, yeah. got some. There's a couple of brands that have that. Those are kind of interesting. Those are cool. They're I've cool. had them before where the wheel didn't roll though. Yeah, it was like the wheel's got a. But when it rolls, yeah. that's nice. Yeah, that's got to be functional. That's and it's nice. like obviously they're they're meant more for like dress shirts, thinner stuff. You're not going to want to stick those on your jeans, right? You know, but if you're doing that kind of thing, um, so yeah, I mean, I don't have a super strong opinion. I don't have like. It's not that I was trying to avoid or anything, but I just, you know, I guess my least favorite clips would be like, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of like the Kuwaiko like clip on clip. It's oh. like not really part of the pen. I'm yeah. like, why bother? Nah. Just, you know, don't even bother with that kind of thing. So I don't like clips that are like kind of an afterthought. You know, that's not really my thing. Um, but I like the ones that are just balanced really well with the pen and that don't have like really sharp edges mm -hmm. and are not too hard, not too soft. You know, just like a little Goldilocks style clip, you know, just right. Baby bear. Yeah, baby, baby bear is that in? That's the one that is that's the one just she always right. chooses. Yeah, yeah. I could legitimately couldn't remember that the other day. We were trying to do the thing. I got a little dyslexia, so like when I'm trying to tell my kids like stories like that, and I just legitimately haven't like read those stories in a long time. I'm like, oh yeah, doesn't she like always do like the papa bear is too big and the baby bear is too small and the mama's just right? And Rachel's like, nah. Yeah, and then she not that eats way. the poison apple and lets her hair down <laughs> so that the uh, rumpled still skin can climb up. Well, and my kids also like to have fun by like saying the wrong things on purpose all the oh, time. Oh no, so that's, that's... Ne that doesn't help. <laughs> no. Like they purposely mix up <laughs> stories and say things incorrectly and that's... mispronounce things for fun. Oh. 
So a, a few years of that with both kids in my brain, oh, and yeah. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just confused. Yeah. Yeah, and you're done. Rachel remembers everything. She's got a steel trap memory. Yeah. So you don't com- need to use yours. I got 20 years of conditioning of not really having to remember things like that. Right. You know, and so I just it just doesn't stick in my brain nice. anymore. Instead, I deep dive on things like exchange rates and resin materials. Anyway. Cool. You ready for number five? I think so. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. This is from our friend Alan. Right. Own owner of a Monte Grappa Chaos, by the way. Ah, oh, Alan. That's right. Lucky man. Yeah, jealous. Oh, all right. <laughs> Alan says, I hear a lot of people who don't like gold trim on pens. Hmm. Do you see this in your sales data? Hmm. Does rhodium trim sell substantially better, or is this a vocal minority? Interesting. Yeah. Um, so it does it does change over time, you know, not to go with the classic it depends answer, but I will say that this is a preferential thing that can shift, just like which nib size sells better or which, you know, colors of pen are most popular. Ink too. Ink, yeah, all these things. Like this, if you've asked me five years ago or you asked me five years from now, could be a different answer because sentiments can change. Um, so, you know, like all aesthetic elements, it can vary, it can vary by region for sure, like parts of the world. Gold may be really popular. Rhodium may be really popular at the same time. Um, or it could be like an overall sentiment that kind of shifts over time because of a variety of reasons. Um, I would say I think that rhodium is more popular, generally speaking. Right now, and, for sure. And has been for us. And we, you know, have has some been sales for to quite back a that while. Up. Yeah, it's not like necessarily universal. It's not like everything rhodium is going to outsell everything gold. But I think generally speaking, rhodium is a more universally, you know, desired trim material. Um, but gold has its place too. I would say that gold trim these days is viewed as a slightly more limiting because it has a more distinct, it's a less neutral color. It's, it is a color. It, in, it's in an a actual way, color. Yeah. yeah, it's a yellow. It's a warm tone. So you, if you take a yellow tone clip and put it on something that yellow generally doesn't go with quite as much, it just looks a little weird and it's not going to be as popular of a pen. But rhodium pretty much can go with anything. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I think that in general, it's a little safer bet for manufacturers to go with rhodium trim because it's more universally appealing right now. Um, you know, and I think that we can, you know, being honest with you, like to get like hardcore sales data to back that up is there's a lot of different products that we have that have a lot of different trims and all that. And it's just like, I didn't pull all those numbers. So this is a bit anecdotal, but... Um, I did want to, you know, there are some pens that we have where it's like the same exact model that's available in both gold and rhodium trim. Esterbrook's got a few of those, but their stock has come and gone. But I was thinking about the Pilot Falcon, like the the Pilot Falcon Black yeah. is available in both gold and rhodium. And the gold was the only thing available for a long time. Mm-hmm. And then they brought in the rhodium, same exact pen, just two different trims. There you go. And it's interesting because black is like as neutral as you can get on a pen. That's true. That's a good little case you study know, there. Maybe clear would be the other option if you, you know. There should be a clear Falcon, by the way, pilot. There isn't one, but there should be. That would be amazing. Anyway, but black, very universal color. Um, So I pulled the numbers on that that we have. And just looking at the black resin Falcon, not metal, just the resin Falcon, um, it is offered in both trims, 63% gold trim, 37% rhodium trim. So gold is actually slightly more popular on that pen. Now, could be because... It's been available in the gold trim for so much longer than the rhodium that that's more iconic and that's what it's more known for. But when I really thought about it, there's a lot of other colors of the Falcon that are available that only come in rhodium trim. So I think you're actually cannibalizing some of the rhodium trim in the other colors Mm. of the resin Falcon. So when I pulled those numbers, you add in the red, the purple, and the blue Falcon with the black, it flips the other way. You got 57% rhodium. 43% 43% gold trim. Mm. And that's not even factoring the metal falcons, which all the metal falcons are rhodium trim. Rhodium, yeah. So that, I, I didn't factor that in because that, that doesn't just count. seems there's, like too, no too complicated. Yeah. So, you know. And they're and, different pens. Yeah. But even if you just look on our site, the number of pens that have rhodium trim versus gold, significantly more of yeah. the rhodium trim. They're doing that for a reason. They're doing it for, yeah, exactly. For one, yeah, I mean, both materials are expensive. Rhodium and gold are both precious metals. So I don't think it's necessarily like a manufacturing thing per se. Uh, I think it's more just that, again, it speaks back to that like universal appeal and, and universality of, you know, because you think like the the 
manufacturer, they might make one pen and all the clips, all the trim are exactly the same on the model of pen, but they have all these different colors and materials and stuff like that that they swap out. So if they're gonna have one trim that they're gonna use on a pen model, they want it to be the most universal thing that will work with whatever material that they're gonna use on it. Oftentimes that's gonna be rhodium. So if it was, you know, if everybody was dying to have gold trim everywhere, we, people would be asking for that all the time and manufacturers would make it. So you would see more options of gold things. So I think just even looking at the offerings of stuff that's out there, um, you can pretty much assume that, yeah, more rhodium pens are gonna be selling than gold pens. But I don't think it's like a, it's not like a 10 to one or anything like that. Um, and I think we're maybe even a little bit skewed just because we probably sell more of like the, new and interesting and like special limited edition type things. Whereas somebody who deals more in like the corporate space and is dealing with stuff that's much more like traditional, the like black pen with gold trim kind of thing, maybe, you know, um, I don't know, more popular or universal or whatever, but I don't know. But yeah, that's what I, that's all I got. I don't yeah. have any like harder I, numbers on any of that. I agree but, with you. Yeah, I think <laughs> they are in general more popular right now. Cool. What do y'all think? I would love to know what you think about your trim preferences. Has it changed over time? Is it purely like, no, I don't have a specific preference. It really depends on the like per pen basis. Like if a pen looks really good in gold, I'm gonna buy it in gold. If it looks really good in rhodium, I'm gonna buy it in rhodium. Let us know what you think in the comments. And that's it for Q and A's. We got a special little segment here. Drew did a little uh, poll on Instagram and he's gonna share that with us. Okay, so we actually did a couple of polls and mm. in just searching through Instagram for Q and A questions, I came across these two things that I had spoken to some of our Instagram followers about, and I thought it would be interesting to just kind of discuss with you and share with mm. our pen friends here on the YouTubes. So I asked our Instagram audience if libraries, public libraries, were all of a sudden uh, renting out fountain pens for use, hmm. what would be the first fountain pen that they would check out? Um, hmm. And the answers were pretty interesting. Not super surprising, mm -hmm. but I have a list here. And I um, okay. these are our top five mm -hmm. with two tied for the number five spot. Oh. And I just thought I'd kind of get your opinion. Okay. Okay. So the top pens were Mont Blanc. And that's just usually just they, they just say like a, a Mont Blanc. Oh, yeah. Mont Blanc. Okay. Um, Visconti Homo Sapiens. Mm -hmm. um, and then two other people just said Visconti. So I added that into the Homo Sapiens just because assuming that they were probably talking about a Homo okay. Sapiens. Um, uh, then most people just said a sailor pen with like two more people saying, uh, uh, like something specific, two people said a pro gear. One person said 1911, but I lumped those into this too. Sure. Okay. Um, pilot custom eight 23 mm. specific fill on that one. Mm -hmm. No one just said a pilot pen, mm. uh, and then pilot vanishing point Lamy 2000. So again, Mont Blanc, homo sapiens, sailor pilot custom eight 23 pilot vanishing point. 2000. Hmm. So I'll, these are the top five. They're all like staple pens. With, with two, yeah. which one do you think people were the most curious about? Like that would be their, the first thing they checked out to try. First thing they checked out to try mm -hmm. of all these? Mm -hmm. The most popular answer. Um, To our audience, I would mm -hmm. say maybe the Homo sapiens. That was the second most. Okay. Uh, number one was the Lamy 2000. Really? People are very curious to try the Lamy. That was by far the most. By um, far? By really? far, yep. How about that? Yep. Um, Mont Blanc makes sense because, well, for one, we don't sell Mont Blanc. So, I mean. Mont Blanc was number five. Really? Uh, tied with the 823. Interesting. The 823 and the Mont Blanc were uh, both huh. both number five. Mont Blanc so, is like so known as a brand. Yeah. They've done more marketing well, than just any the, other company. Just the fact that people yeah. who follow us and we don't even sell Mont Blanc said Mont Blanc, like that yeah. goes to show you just how popular Their branding the brand is, is really strong. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So number one was the 2000. Okay. Number two was the Homo sapiens. Okay. Um, and then number three was the pilot vanishing point. People very curious to try a vanishing I point. I can see that. It's it's not like any other pen. And Lamy 2002 actually makes sense because it's, yeah. it's, it's different. different looking and they, than they most hear the about pens. it. Yeah. Um, we talk about it all the time. Yeah. And the, uh, the I think that the Homo sapiens surprised me because hmm. it's just, it's such, it seems like a polarizing pen because it's so popular hmm. and it is a grail pen for so many people. Hmm. And I think I think people just find it so alluring and hmm. interesting and mysterious and like, oh, the, the lava pen from, it's, it's for so many years, it has stayed in this zone of hmm. fascination sure. for people. And I just find that so interesting. Yeah. And 
it hasn't really fallen from that. People are still just so curious about yeah. trying that pen and seeing what the big deal is. I mean, kind of like it kind of falls into Mont Blanc and maybe Sailor a little bit where it's it's a pretty expensive pen. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly like an impulse buy. It's it's even if you're really into fountain pens to just like buy one on a whim, hoping you like it is it's a bit of a yeah. it's a bit of a stretch. And I think the 2000 mm -hmm. also it being, you know, far and away the number one is just very different definitely not yeah. a sure thing because it doesn't look like any yeah. standard fountain it is, pen. It is, you know, like the vanishing point, like it is kind of its own experience. Right, and that, yeah. that, that is one commonality with a lot mm -hmm. of these pens. You know, you take away the, the Sailor, the 823, all of the others are very unique. They are unique. Yeah, they yeah. stand out. Even Sailor, I think a lot of people hear about how the nibs are mm -hmm. and it's kind of unique from some other pens and the Homo sapiens, the material, the price and all that. 823, the vacuum fill and all that. Vanishing point, the clicky, and then the yeah, they've all got strong yeah. reputations, and also the vanishing makes point sense. makes sense. The vanishing point might also be sought after to try because people are a little unsure of the clip positioning, yeah, and maybe aren't sure is this going to bother my That's grip. True. That's true. So I think all of these are really great answers, and when you think about it, you can totally understand why each one would be uh, a lot of people's first choice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I found that really interesting, and I'd be curious uh, if if you didn't already answer the Instagram poll, I'd be curious what what you uh, would choose and why. Wow, that would be cool. There's like twenty thousand public libraries in the U.S. Just to supply one pen to each library. Oh, of course. Like, I don't even know if they make that many. No, oh, I'm sure they like don't. Like eight twenty threes in a year or whatever. Another <laughs> question not. that I asked the Instagram audience was, do you consider fountain pens to be your number one hobby? like your, oh. your primary hobby. Mm. And most people said no. No? Most people that follow us on Instagram that replied to this, 61% um, said no, this is not their primary hobby. Okay. I mean, I can see that. I can see that. I, I don't know what I was going to suppose on that one. I, I guess... I mean, 39% said yes. That to me is like, that's a lot. It is a lot, yeah. Number one hobby. Like, think of how many things you follow on Instagram. You know, you, probably more than 61% of them, you would say, like, this is not my number one hobby. You just follow it because it's kind of interesting, right? Yeah, so I like mean- So, to me, like, 39% is, like, that's really high. Yeah, I, I would think. probably say video games are my number one hobby. Probably probably the thing I spend the most money on, the most of my free time on. But yet, I don't follow- like any game related Instagram pages. Really? I don't know. Really? It's like, I, why not? I just know what I like. I know it'll like, I've got my preferences dialed in. I, I, I seek it out if I want. Hmm. I don't need anything coming at me. And also okay. just like, it's so common. It's like barely even, it's like saying movies are a hobby. It's like, hmm. is it really at this point? It's just as our generation gets older, it's not really like video games are not a niche thing anymore. It's I just, mean, there's, it's just super common. It's like, I mean, yes and no. It's like, I guess, but I don't know. It's not, I feel like that's less of a hobby and more just like a thing you do, like an, watch TV. An interest, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But okay. what what defines something as a hobby? Like, no, I mean, as it, apart from an activity you just do on a frequent it's definitely, basis. It's definitely a hobby, but it's, it's not in the same realm as fountain pens for me. Fountain pens are like a much more specific hobby. Whereas like watching movies you know, playing video games. Like I mean, the, you've, those like, are, you've like built video game systems out of Raspberry that, Pi. That's different. That's not gaming. That's actually like, I feel like that's a separate hobby because you're using a totally different set of skills. Playing a video game and then... I have a very specific set of skills. <laughs> like playing a video game <laughs> and like doing mods and soldering. Like those are those are not the same activity. You wouldn't put those in all. the same category? They're not the same activity. Using a soldering iron and, play, and holding a controller to make a guy jump or not, it's not the same activity. I mean, if you, you could lump it all into the same general category. Somebody that's not into video games, they would say, oh, if you're designing video game systems or playing a video game, that's that, that, all in the video game That's like That's hobby. like saying that coding is the same as playing a video game. So somebody that is not in that hobby, but it's a completely yes, they would lump that all into It's a completely into different set of skills, you, though. It's like subsets of it, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I guess mean, that's you, like saying that somebody like tunes nibs versus somebody else that, you know, writes a novel by hand with a fountain pen. Like... You're still all fountain I mean, if pens. you want to get really broad, sure, but it's... I mean, how specific are you trying to get? Not everything has to be, like, hyper-specific, right? No, I'm just saying, if, you were, if you're good at soldering, you might hate video games. It's not the same 
set yeah, of skills. There's lots of other things you can solder. You don't necessarily going to end up soldering raspberry pies. I don't even know where we're going with this. Uh, yeah, I don't know what you're trying to say. Number one. Okay. 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 Anyway. I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit. I'm not trying to give credit. I'm just saying I differentiate the hobbies. I don't, okay. I don't consider gaming Fair to be the same as, you know, modifying electronics. Interesting. I don't know. I don't know anything because Joseph was like, Dad, why don't you have any hobbies? I was like, what are you talking about? I don't have any hobbies. I got like Rubik's we Cubes all over the friggin' house. Buku hobbies. Run a friggin' fountain but pen business. Anyway, that YouTube was that was the poll. Know. I found it interesting um, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, most people, I mean, we knew fountain pen people usually have more than one hobby. So there's no surprise there. That's true. Um, okay, cool. Um, to me, to me, 39% is amazing. I think that's really, really high. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. I, cool. I didn't really have any assumptions no made. No preconceived notions? Yeah. No, no, no. Just curiosity. Okay. But uh, yeah, so most people have uh, hobbies that supersede the fountain pen one. Okay. All right. You want to move on to the product spotlight? Let's do it. Boosh. We're going to talk. We covered this last week in our new product, uh, mm -hmm. our new stuff segment. We did. And we're going to talk about this. And this is the Rickshaw Sinclair Model R. Well, now we got some data to back up the fact that Drew's pick of color is the most popular one. All right, so we did launch <laughs> these last week, and we are just about sold out of this one. Uh, by time this airs, this one might be gone, but we're getting more. So this is the brown version of this. Um, we also have the inky rainbow version, as well as the black uh, slash peacock version, and they call it that because inside the case wow. is... That. I like that. So, what is the Sinclair R and why is it called the R? Well, the Sinclair, once upon a time, as you know, Brian, was mm -hmm. made by Knock Co., yeah. which yeah. is was a pen accessory bag company, yeah. soft, soft goods pen company. Pen case company, yeah. Yeah. Um, they went on an indefinite hiatus. People were a little unsure of their future. Mm -hmm. And just recently, debuting at the San Francisco Pen Show 2022, Rickshaw who also makes bags and pen mm -hmm. accoutrement, yeah. uh, unveiled the new Sinclair. The Sinclair was Knox's most popular case, it being a zippered three-pen case with three slots here in the front and then another slot here in the back for a notebook. So three separate pen slots here. Um, the Knock, which you can see that the Knock logo is here in the middle, in addition to the Rickshaw logo on top, uh, the knock was a little bit smaller than this, didn't have the uh, larger zippers, uh, but more or less the same basic design. Rickshaw took it, adapted it, add, added their royal plush lining, which Rickshaw is obviously known for, mm -hmm. and introduced it to the market as a co-branded item. Mm -hmm. And I think it is really cool. The uh, stout has been great. Uh, we actually chose orange. Uh, these all three are exclusive to Goulet pens, by the way. We chose orange as the interior color for the uh, stout brown tweed because Brad Dowdy, owner of Knock Co., is a huge fan of orange. You can find mm -hmm. uh, he's also the co-host of the massively popular Pen Addict podcast and mm -hmm. um, the pen blog, addict blog you know, and all that. Everything. Orange is like very yes. much what he's known for. This is his thing. So we're like, you know what? There you go, Brad. Yeah. Brian is to blue as Brad is to orange. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. So you might know that we have a product called the Koozie Case. So this was a uh, this is a similarly sized uh, product mm -hmm. on the outside. On the inside, it's very different though. On the inside of the Koozie Case, just so you know the difference, there is nothing. It is just an empty void. It's an open bag. It requires that you have koozies like this three pen koozie, another two pen koozie, and another three. Kind of sandwich them together, three, two, three, so that they kind of interlock, and then they go in here. So it's just mm -hmm. a more of a blank slate. There's no predestined, yeah. you know, storage or you could option. stick one, you know, set of uh, koozies in there, and then you can have the bunch of notebooks. Yes, or you can have, you like, want. cram whatever you want in here. So it's much mm -hmm. more open-ended here. No, um, uh, nothing sewn into the interior. Mm -hmm. These, obviously, there is some things sewn into the interior. So it is thinner, so you can't hold quite as many things. If you look at the diameter, it's, it's like you know, half the thickness. Yeah, maybe? it's about half the half the thickness. Yeah. Uh, this one, ten bucks more. So this is sixty. This is fifty. Um, but with this one, you do need to have other things in it. I find this is great for people who want to start with, say, one three pen koozie. Say, you know what? This is this is enough for me. 
then eventually say, mm-hmm. you know what? No, it's not. I want to get more. And yeah, you can they continue. Start, they start and they're inspired by Drew. They're like, I think I'm going to only use three pens at a time. And then they get inspired and by Brian and say, Brian, no, and like, no, two I want more. as many pens as I and possibly can cram no, into this thing. three more. And then once they have a bunch of them, then you can shove all those into your koozie case. Um, this yeah. is perfect for the people who just want three. Um, and then want a little bit spot for uh, more. And you can fit another small notebook in here or as if, well. If you're inspired by Brian, you can stick three pens in there. You can take a bunch of other pens, stick it on the other side. You can. And then you can cram a bunch more pens in the middle and you, you can fit like 15 in there. You can indeed. And I'll take this opportunity <laughs> to show them that with what is going to be our, ex- our next exclusive color. Ooh. We're calling this Arcade Carpet. <laughs> And I am not the super, catchiest name. I am. Oh, it's very catchy. But it's on the nose for what this it is. is. Absolutely. So it is. <laughs> it is very like it just all you need to make it remind you of like a '90s you know mall arcade is some like old black chewing gum stuck to it. So oh yeah, um, like, this is what we're movie, doing. Movie theater carpet. Too, this is not on the there. website yet. Don't go looking for it. Don't bother customer care team asking when it's going to show up. It'll show up in the next couple of weeks. So yeah. just you're literally getting the first look of it. Yes, this is the first time. So this is the first also the first time we've shown anything on the podcast that we didn't have on the website. So if you get fussy about it and you start bugging customer care about it, then we're not going to show you anything or else ever again. So if you're listening to it in the audio version of the podcast, I'm really sorry because you have no way to actually right. see what we're talking well, about right now just, until we put just, it on the website. Just picture arcade carpet. And I don't think you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. I think you, you've, if you're listening, you think of arcade carpet, you're going to have a pretty yeah. good idea what this is. So lots anyway. Of, lots of purple, in here, teal, yellow, pink. In here, I have a two-pen koozie, and then I've got you know pens in here. This fits really nicely uh, sandwiching in between the three pens. Uh, you could also do three pens, a two-pen koozie, and then three other pens, like Brian was saying, on this side. It gets yeah. a little chunky at that point, but it can still yeah, be done. Yeah, it does. So if you wanted to yeah, pack this thing in, you definitely Chunk it could. out. Chunk it out. I think that three and then a two koozie <laughs> is perfect. It keeps it nice and slim. You get that form factor, and then you can still have room for a notebook here in the front. So I think that the Sinclair is a really, really awesome case. And then you can fit that whole thing in your cargo shorts pocket. Yes, you can. This is a perfect, yeah. this is a perfect size for your cargo Should we shorts try? pocket. I got some cargo shorts. Yeah, man, get it in there. Okay, let's see. Get it done. Yeah, that's good. Live demo here. Yeah. You got Velcro pockets today. Oh, yeah, Velcro. Look at that. The rivets oh, in case man. They get filled with water, I guess. Look at that, Drew. Look at that. I think I can actually Velcro oh, it. Oh, man. You are ready to go. Ready. Ready for adventure. Ready. Let's assemble some carports. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I might. You never know. You never know with Brian. Wait till the what's happening section. Who's got a carport needs to be assembled? Yeah. Bring I've, it. I've done that. Um, fun little extra <laughs> bonus fact, Brian. Mm-hmm. After we talked about colors and autumn colors last pen cast i went and i inked up some autumny colors into my pens so i've got brown red and this like woodsy color okay um, all inked up with look at you also coordinating colors so i'm like i'm all about the fall colors right now i've got a ruby red all-star which you mentioned in our um uh, pe- uh discontinued pens yeah. segment, which I uh, cut out and made a slice of this mm-hmm. week. So if you want to see more of the uh, Brian talk about the Ruby Red All-Star, that video is up. I like that color so this much. This one I did Diamond Pumpkin in here. Okay. Which is in our Interesting. Uh, fall colors set, mm-hmm. uh, example set. Um, my, that one is going to, you're going to get some crustaceans on that one. We'll Pump, see. Pumpkin is a crusty bugger. So, so far, so good. No, no, no crustaceans yet. Oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I've been using it a lot. Because right. it's, a, it's a, I have a 1.5 nib on here. Okay. So I'm putting out a lot of ink, and it shades so well. God, it's a good shade. so gorgeous. It's a, yeah, it's a nice color. Um, I've got That's three nice. discontinued pens right here. Um, I've got a brown arrow. Such and a tease. In this, you're showing I, things we don't have released yet. Well, I'm, the inks, <laughs> the inks, I haven't. So in this one, I also have a Monteverde giraffe, which I had never used before. Right. But Adrian and I found it and said this would be great for the autumn set. Yeah. And I inked it up, and oh my gosh, it really is. Yeah. It is a great ink. I right. love. I'm like, okay, Monteverde giraffe. I would have never. It's a like, weird name. It but... is, and and I'm like, I think the name just kind of turned me off of it. But sure. inked it up, used it, great. This one. I'm just going to put you right on the spot here. Uh, Pollard Willows Visconti Van Gogh, which we don't sell anymore. And I know. Oh, you cherry picked that one too. You went through like every one we had on the shelf. I did. This is like that is, one. I've had, this is my favorite Visconti by far. <laughs> also, I have an ink in here that we don't sell either. Okay. This is Ferris Wheel Press Buttered Popcorn. Buttered Popcorn? That was like the one that you were I'm pushing gonna, for? I'm Right now, <laughs> I'm putting it out there. Are you trying to like crowdsource I'm, support for I'm, it? I'm, 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 I'm getting aggressive <laughs> with this. I'm going to 
I'm not going to shut up about it. Rachel, I'm going to let Drew, her know too. You know it's not me that you have we to convince are, on this. I will talk to Rachel because look look at this. I just want you to I just want you to see this. Look at how beautiful this is. Look how visual that is for a yellow, right? You can it's a totally, good yellow, right? And that's a yellow you can actually read. Is it? That's a beautiful yellow. I'm telling you, butter popcorn. Let's make it happen, Brian. That's nice. All right. It's like a like a harvest gold type color. It is. I'm going to I'm going to formally submit this to Rachel and just okay. beg. All right. So uh, yeah, that's the those are the koozie cases. Nice. Feeling good about them. Get excited yeah. for arcade carpet. I like it. I like that format. Boom. I was always a fan of the Sinclair. Yes. You know why? Because three pens is all you need. Mm. Or fifteen. Mm -hmm. if you want to cram it in there? Shove it in your cargo shorts. You're ready to go. You could have you could have one of these in each of your pockets. I could have thirty pens. <laughs> ready for anything. All right. And cool. most of them would need to be cleaned. Are you ready for what's happening? <laughs> Let's move on to what's happening. All right, Drew. All right. What have you been up to uh, last week? Making my back hurt. Oh. Yeah. Is that so? Yeah. All yeah. day Saturday. You sound like you're a middle-aged guy pushing 40. All day Saturday, all day Sunday, I was putting together, uh, as you know, because you gave me some wood for it, uh, yeah. a indoor play gym. For my son. Yeah. Why so not? So he asked for a tree house and I was like, okay, well, mm. I can do that. It would be a square around a tree <laughs> with a railing mm -hmm. and a ladder. Like that, that I could do. I could figure that out. Um, okay. It won't be much more, it won't be at all more than that. And I said, or, and I'm hedging my bets here, I was like, or, this thing and I showed him a picture of you know I'd done some research found a really really well made indoor play gym much more expensive than what a treehouse would be but it wouldn't maybe it wouldn't yeah I don't know lumber have you ever seen they literally have TV shows about like oh no no what I would do what I would do no 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 um <laughs> I don't even own a saw. You, you know, take I like an borrow my brother's saw. You take like an old pallet and just like nail it up in a tree. No, I mean, I did. I actually did find some instructions on Etsy, you know, with measurements and stuff. Oh, so, yeah, because sure. I don't trust yeah. my own building skills. I would need to follow plans. Follow plans, yeah. But yeah. It, it would be, it, it's outside. Like the mosquitoes are terrible in our backyard. My yeah. son is allergic to everything. And you, he would only get in it a few times. And he also doesn't like to be like on his own. Like he, even playing mm. Legos, he'll bring them downstairs. So like, he's not gonna wanna be in the backyard by himself. Just yeah. like. I feel like that's a reason why you do tree houses for your kids is to like have them play outside and like be out of the house. Yeah, more. I mean, he does sometimes, but he definitely prefers to just be around people. But mm. anyway, I said, okay, we can do this for you or I can buy, or we can do this thing. And he's like, oh yeah, that indoor thing with the bars and the swings and you know. It does look pretty cool. Uh, it's, it was pretty epic. Um, and I wanted to do something that he'll remember. So it, just so he doesn't grow up and be like, oh yeah, my dad wouldn't give me a tree house. Now he's gonna be able to say, oh, my dad built me a freaking play gym in my playroom. Like, yeah. so it's legit. I wanted it to be memorable. So all of it was just tiny little bolts and screws and yeah. it's really well made. So it was actually really fun to put together. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and like it's, an erector set, like that type yeah, of thing? Yeah, it felt like I was yeah. putting together gym equipment because it's yeah. very heavy. All of the metal, well, it's gotta be, yeah. all the metal was like really heavy metal with that, like, you know how gym equipment has this kind of like almost ceramic coating that's yeah. slightly bumpy? Yeah. It was that sort of stuff. Yeah, for like additional like grip and texture and stuff, yeah. Yeah, well just like not, not, not the grip, like the metal parts, like if you've seen like a, uh, any sort of bench press or um, uh, mm. how the it's that gray metal that's like oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. that I know stuff I don't like know the powder coating yeah yeah yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. Of stuff yeah but but slightly mm -hmm. textured you know so it was all that yeah, stuff like Be this like it's on the bottom of the mic stand here. yeah yeah kind of like that that kind of a texture um yeah. but man it was legit I did break mm. the glass dome uh on the uh flush mount ceiling fixture that uh, was up there shattered oh. shattered that thing real awesome. good um good job because all the bars were just like pressure uh um attention bars uh from okay. the floor to ceiling and uh yeah i did break that so i needed to buy another light fixture well because you know how much i love that what you probably did was save him from breaking it at some point you know what i <laughs> I, I thought about that and the one i purchased was a very very slim we're talking like that slim okay. led with a plastic uh yeah. cover so that's safer yeah very much safer so i do need to do that and i hate that but i think i can actually stand on the gym and not have to bring the ladder in there we'll see hopefully it's strong enough yeah i don't know how safe that is oh it's strong enough it's got a 220 pound weight limit i was on it oh I yeah couldn't, i couldn't be on that well i think it go i think it's like technically 
it's officially 220, but yeah. I think you, the breaking limit is higher than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 260 would probably be fine. Yeah. Um, but that was pretty much my whole weekend. And I am. Sounds I am, awesome. I am feeling. Sounds like it. a great weekend in my book. I would have liked to have a little bit of my downtime because then the previous weekend was when I drove to get the dog. So yeah, I just, you've had some back to back. Yeah, I just I would like to have like yeah. a really lazy weekend, mm-hmm. just just a little bit. But mm-hmm. it's fine. I, I'm I'm very happy with how it all turned out. Um, and uh, he's not going to forget this thing for sure. And we've got some friends coming over on Friday, and they're going to bring their two daughters. So they're all going to be up there just going nuts on the thing. Oh yeah. I I, I it, I've been kind of setting money aside for this monstrosity for about a year. Uh, I use an app called Digit on my phone okay. that you basically set a goal and you say, I want to have this much money by this date. And oh, it just cool. takes a little bit out of your account right. here and there. So you kind of don't think about it. Like, you know, like seven a, bucks here. Like a digital thief. Yeah. And then <laughs> and then it says, okay, goal reached. And uh, you can buy something insane with money that you didn't really know had been taken from you. Nice. So... It's worked like out hacking your hacking your own financial yes because i well know. well well-being and also it doesn't feel as bad it doesn't feel as like oh my god do i really want to spend this much money on that thing if it was all in one big like expense coming right out of your checking it just feels yeah. different than like oh no this money already was yeah. for that so one would one might call that a sinking fund sure so like yeah you set money aside in advance and then when you have enough you buy the thing that's yep. a great financial mechanism yeah so yeah. that's what i did yeah. And uh, now Rachel, and I, Rachel and I do that like when we had to get our roof replaced on our house. It was like, okay, how long is this roof going to last? Right. Let me put away like whatever, 20 bucks a month or yeah. something like that. And it's just like every month that just, you know, makes you realize like how much things cost when you're like, how long does, how long is this car going to last? How much is my next car going to cost? If I save in advance, like how much is it going to be? It's like, dang. Yeah. So yeah, we have, sink, we, have, we have sinking ones for a lot of like big ticket items that's in smart. our personal that's finances. Smart. So yeah, good job, man. That's awesome. Yeah. And we, we also, I, I mentioned that we got our, uh, some anniversary photos done and taken. Yeah, so we got those, really yeah, good. we got those back. They were really good. Um, that's awesome. Uh, we were really, really happy with them. Having the opportunity to do that was really, really cool. That's so cool. now we can finally hang something up in our house that doesn't look like crap. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah, you can great. have like a shrine to yourselves in your no, house. No, just <laughs> just one thing to kind of just represent us. Yeah. We don't have all of our pictures are just like uh, really friends, kids. You know, mm. not friends, kid. Like our kid, our friends. You know, not we didn't <laughs> really have any good pictures of us together. Okay, yeah, just gotcha. like selfies and stuff. So, oh uh, yeah, yeah, no, be nice good, to have something like that. Yeah. That's awesome. What have you been up to? Uh well, you know me. I've been up to things. Cutting things down, smashing doing things, some things, building things. Um, not so much cutting things down, definitely building things. Um, so yeah, I'm working on building a headboard for my nephew. Like a He's bed? Got a, like a bed, headboard. Oh, yeah. Okay. He, so um, his parents, Rachel's sister, got, um, I mean, Rachel's sister and whatever, you get it. Um, they bought him like a um, like a platform bed, you know, that's got like the drawers underneath it, mm-hmm. you know, the mattress, but it has like no headboard of any kind. So he... He has like kind of an end table because he's got like an alarm clock and water and a lamp and all that kind of stuff. But like he's like knocking it over all the time and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, they just they know I like woodworking and asked if I could build something that was, you know, somewhat custom. They couldn't really find something that matched the the platform bed thing that they have. So it's basically like sort of a box that goes up at the head of the bed mm-hmm. and it's like, you know, 12 inches deep, you know, so it's like a little bit of like so a the bookcase bed kind, kind of a thing. Into it? No, it's just going to go behind the bed. Okay. You know, so it's like, it'll be, think of it kind of like a bookshelf, I guess, that'll just kind of like go up to the bed. So it'll be like flat and go flat against the bed, but then there'll be like 12 inch like bookshelf type thing that'll be, you know. If do, they, do the bookshelf jut out over the bed? No. Oh. No. So like you have bed mm-hmm. and then like the piece of furniture is like, pfft, like on the end. Okay. That's all. And then like from where the bed is, it's going to have like little cubbies sort of thing. So okay, like you gotcha. can put stuff on top. You can, you know, he can put his like stuffed animals or like an alarm clock or whatever, like kind of up in the cubby, gotcha. but it's meant to be accessed like from the bed, oh. not necessarily like from the rest of the right. room. Right. You know? And it's going to be short. It's going to be like a little less than three feet tall. So it's really meant to kind of fit the bed and cool. kind of match up to the bed. Yeah. But they got like, you know, they bought it was like a, you know, assemble yourself furniture type deal, but I'm building it out of uh, 
walnut, solid walnut. Oh, wow. Yeah, because it's like a walnut-y color, you know, one of these types of things. So I was like, yeah, I got some solid walnut. I'll go ahead and make it out of that. So I'm just like using crazy looking walnut pieces because walnut, you know, most, most of the time when you buy furniture that's like, looks like walnut, it's like pretty straight grained and looks pretty consistent. But the thing I like about getting wood that you get like from more of solid logs, especially walnut has a lot of variation in it. And uh, I don't know, I think that makes for more interesting pieces. So they were driving with that and they kind of wanted like some, yeah, you know, plus it's more meaningful. It's like, I'm making it for my nephew. Yeah. And it's like going to be sentimental kind of a thing. So yeah, I've been working on that. But I mean, literally I'm taking it down from a, I mean, it's dry wood. So I got the wood from a guy that has a kiln and all that kind of stuff, but it's basically like flat sawn logs with raw edges and stuff like that. And I am literally cutting, shaping, flattening everything and turning it into a headboard. So I've gotten to the point where I've gotten all the measurements done because I had to like go take measurements and basically custom design this thing. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I've gotten to the point where I've gotten basically all the pieces pretty much cut out, mostly sanded, and I just basically have to assemble the thing and put a finish on it. So you have some pictures? I'll have some pictures. Yeah, I can show you right now. Oh, I'm the same for the pen cast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, I mean, it's not much to see right now, uh, but it's, yeah, I mean, at least in my opinion. Um, but I can show you real quick. So there's like the pieces of Ooh. wood. Yeah, but you can see it's like lots of variation in there. And I got like sap wood and knots and all kinds of stuff going on. And then once the finish is on it, it's going to like. Really nice. Pop. Got a lot of figure in there. Yeah, so it's been really fun. So, yeah, I'm doing that. Um, I've been working on this for a while, just kind of like here and there, because they're not like in a super rush for it or anything, no. but we're heading up there in a couple of weekends. So it's like, okay, I have like a deadline of sorts, yeah. you know, so it's like, I'm pretty close to being done with it. So it's like, all right, this will be my project to kind of like focus on in the workshop and, uh, and I'll do that. So that's happening. So I'll, I'll post more picture. I mean, I'll have this picture kind of in progress. I'll post more once I've got more updates. Um, we went to this weekend, we went to King's Dominion Fall Fest. So basically like summertime's over, the water park is closed and all that, but King's Dominion, which is our local like theme park, um, they have um, like a Charlie Brown themed like kids area or peanuts themed or whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it. So they have, you know, trick or treating and things design fall festival type thing. And then like at night it becomes like a creepy spook fest and my kids hate that kind of <laughs> stuff. So we went during the day to the like lighthearted harvest festival right. type theme kind of a thing. And we met up with, you know, some of their friends from school and went and did some things. Joseph did literally nothing. He didn't want to write anything. That sounds but, like my son. Yeah, but he was playing balloons on his phone and he was loving it. So, but we got him outside and he was walking and that was good. So <laughs> Rachel wrote a couple of things. High standards. Yeah, I rode like the swing thing. I rode that, uh, I don't know if you've ever ridden the like really tall, the wind seeker, I think it's called. I haven't been to King's Dominion. Um, but anyway, like so years. that's so that's that was my view. I snuck my phone on there and took some video. You're like a couple hundred feet up in the air, just like swinging around, looking. I got a little bit dizzy. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> but I don't know. Uh, you know, I got some great views of like the park. You know, that was and oh, it was yeah. a beautiful day. That is nice. Just that like sky looks crisp fall day, it was like sixty degrees. So it's like I could walk around, was not sweating through layers of clothing, you know. But it was cool and it was really good. So. Kind of miss fun. not having been able to do stuff outside. I was yeah, working sorry. on that thing. Yeah, that's all right. You'll get there. I would have just You'll cleaned out my storage area. I just need to kind of empty yeah. that out and put things back. You know, that's good too. Yeah, that's, I like doing that too. That's just Clearing helpful. out my sheds and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Yep. You just kind of just the act of taking everything out, putting it back. You realize like, no, no, don't need to put this back. Yeah, you know, there's yeah. a lot of stuff you don't need to put back. That's true. Yeah. Um, or you're like, oh, I bought another one of these because I lost i thought i lost it but here it's been in the shed the whole time yeah um made some s'mores with the kids Ooh. so we got like a little just a really small crappy like little portable fire pit kind of thing outside so yeah my oh, kids, like real fire though yeah yeah, oh, yeah, yeah real nice. fire. Like i my, mean they make they make weird little like electronic ones or microwave i mean ones. those are, are like propane powered or whatever but like we don't have any natural gas we don't have you know so it's like nice okay, i could do all that stuff but s'mores are delightful my kids hate bugs they hate grass and all these things and all that so i'm like you know what setting up a little portable fire pit and it's this dinky little thing that we just like can move easily. Yeah. I set it up like in the middle of our driveway with like the lights from the house that can shine out there and I can turn it on and off or whatever. And then I don't have to worry about embers coming out and getting in the yard and all that kind of stuff. It's just like on the driveway and it's fine. So yeah, I did that. Made some s'mores. 
Had a good old time. Nice. Kids like that. I have a reputation for burning my marshmallows because I get impatient, but I didn't catch, I think I barely caught one on fire this time, but I like really was on my marshmallow game. Nice. All toasty brown? Yeah, it was Ooh, like perfect, well like golden brown. Like, yeah, I really well nailed done. it. Well done, I am proud yeah, of you. Nailed it. But it's fun. Like Ellie wanted to like go pick out the sticks with me for the roasting and it's like a whole like You didn't thing. overproduce the sticks, did you? I mean, not overproduced. What did you do? I produced high quality <laughs> roasting sticks. <laughs> I mean, I picked up sticks like, you know, off the yard and whatnot. But then like, you know, I got the sticks and I always like, I like to cut off all the little nubbins. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want like sharp bits and stuff like that. Okay. I always got this thing about splinters. She's did, like, did, did you just use your pocket knife or did you get out something else? No, I used it. Well, I used it. To use, well, okay. So I did have some like clippers, some like, you know, things like you would use to clip like branches on like okay. a rose bush or something. Okay. All right. Like the, I use that and then like a. No pocket knife. You know? Okay, that's not crazy. I didn't use any like saws. You could have done. You could have done gasoline more. Gasoline powered. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, no, no. It was. It was. It was. It was so let me just get this on the lathe real quick, Ellie. Hold on. <laughs> no, Dad, I'll no, be no, right no. back. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. But it was fun. Like so, going and like picking out good sticks with Ellie and all that kind of stuff. It was really fun. Um, and then my big outdoor project right now is. Um, so remember that log bridge thing that I oh, built yeah. across that swampy area? Yeah. Yeah, so that thing's falling apart. You, it's not holding up you, <laughs> super great. Yeah, you didn't meant, you didn't have a ton of like faith in its longevity, I yeah, don't think. Yeah, it was a proof of concept. Yeah. And to be fair, you know, it's gotten some some pretty heavy use. You like drive and things like, over it, don't you? Oh, yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I can bike and walk and all that kind of stuff. But like, you know, I thought it was going to sink down more into the mud and then have like support from underneath the logs, mm. but it really hasn't sunk down very much. So I pretty much have like logs kind of like elevated because I did like logs long ways. Oh, yeah. And then I did a whole bunch of them across mm. like in a whole bridge fashion. Cause I thought it would like sink cause it was a super muddy area. Yeah. I thought it would just like sink right down. And then I thought I would have a bed of logs that would be flat on the ground connected to like runners of logs that would be more like sunk down into the mud. And I thought that was a good idea, but they never sunk all the way down. So hmm. essentially what I had was this like log bridge where it had like a six inch gap uh. up off the ground. Mm. And over time, what's happened is like all the gap parts have like been breaking and kind of wearing through. So they're, uh. they're not holding up super great anymore. Are you gonna have to take it all out now? I am taking it out uh. one bit at a time. So oh, I've got man. some some progress on there, which is is working. I'm at least half done now. So what I'm doing now, I figured out how to actually build something more sustainable across a very muddy area. It's uh, it's called a corduroy road. Didn't know what the term was. This is a very common thing in my life. I'm always like, there's gotta be a way to do this weird thing I'm yeah. trying to do. I just don't know what it's called. So always I don't know way. how to find it. So hunt around enough on YouTube and you'll find corduroy roads. So essentially what it is, is you, you flatten out the soil, you put down a layer of like landscape fabric, like you would have for like weed prevention stuff. And then you put down your logs right on the ground, put more fabric on top, and then you just put dirt over top of it. So, you know, eventually the logs will kind of break down over time, but they're, so they're supported. And what it does is it allows water and stuff to still pass through because it's not like, dense packed in there because the problem is we have like hard clay around here and the water just does not move through yeah, the clay. maybe the logs just like hit clay and didn't want to sink anymore i think that's what happened because it's like solid clay yeah. so like the water it does not absorb into this clay so it just like sits there and swampifies so this i think is the ticket so i'm taking and replacing just the straight up logs which a lot of them are, are still good and usable, especially for this purpose. So I'm like pulling them all up and then in like eight foot sections at a time, I'm like reprepping it down, doing the fabric, throwing the logs back down and then just throwing dirt over top. So it's not like the most complicated thing in the world. And it involves like no hardware or tools of any kind, nice. really. So I'm slowly but surely doing that. It's much more solid and- Corduroy you know, Road. Corduroy Road. All they right. do it a lot in like for logging and you know places where they're like, timber harvesting, stuff like that, where they need, you know, a solid roadbed where they're gonna be hauling a lot of stuff, but they're not trying to build something that is like more permanent or like damages the environment. So you basically, if you're logging, you can use the logs that you're using to essentially kind of clear for the road. And then you kind of like lay them down in there and it gives you a solid road base for a number of years. And it doesn't require like permits or anything because you're using just all natural materials and stuff like that. So it's a very eco-friendly way to have a reasonably, you know, non, not as temporary passage as if you were just driving over mud. Huh. So yeah, I think for my needs, 
you know, just riding bikes and going for hikes and stuff like that, I think it'll work just fine. Fantastic. Yeah. So well, it looks good. Really wish I'd known that when I did it the first time because it's way less work than the log bridge thing I was trying to do last time. But, you know, you live and learn. So, and you like doing this stuff anyway. I love doing it. Just being out there and it's like, yeah, 60 degrees. And I see a stray yellow jacket every now and then. And I'm like, what are you doing here? Isn't it cold? Shouldn't you be dead by now? <laughs> Mid October, like, but it's okay. They've been good. And then, last thing, my kids have been on this kick lately. So, given that I'm into woodworking and all this stuff, I get magazines and catalogs and things like that. Well, they just think it's like the funniest thing in the world when I read them bedtime stories like from my woodworking catalogs. So I'll just open up to an obscure like woodworking product and just read them like- Like the description like of the, the product? description of the products. <laughs> this is the stuff my kids do. Like they tell mixed up stories and they say things wrong for fun and they think it's hilarious. When I, so I thought I would share. I you can you read us a bedtime story? I'll do some bedtime stories and I, I get a little <laughs> bit into my like dad mode here. So this is the, um, the wood turners. The wood the Wood Turners Catalog 2023 from Craft Supplies USA. If you're into wood turning, it's, it's a great resource actually. Um, so I got a couple of them. This I'll show you is a little more of nerdy. So the Apprentice Call It Chuck. If you're looking for accuracy and versatility at an affordable price, the Apprentice Call It Chuck is the Chuck for you. <laughs> Precision machine to hold small work such as pen mandrels, bottle stoppers, and finials without marking or damaging the work. It features a large knurled ring for convenient hand tightening that's sufficient in most cases and collets with one 32nd inch range of movements. I was going to ask. Includes body, tightening ring, spindle adapter, tightening levers, and five precision ER32 collets. 100% satisfaction guaranteed. This is the chuck for you. And it's available in one and a quarter inch ATPI with one inch ATPI spindle adapter or one inch ATPI with three quarter inch 16 TPI spindle adapter. I mean, I mean, that would put me to sleep. <laughs> That's a great bedtime story. My kids think this is just like the funniest thing. This is the chuck for you. When I just read a bunch of things, like, because they don't know what any of these. Terms oh, I don't mean. know what any of that means. I, I mean, I know what a, I know what a, Chuck I, is. I know the, what every single one of these things means. Oh, gracious me. And then this was a good one. So this is a, uh, a big lathe. The Powermatic 4224B. The Powermatic 4224B lathe is a true heavy hitter in the large capacity lathe market. Is that a market? I guess it's a market. <laughs> Loaded with features not found on other lathes, the Powermatic 4224B lathe has everything you need and much more <laughs> at a fraction of the price of similar lathes. Well, sign me up. So it's like, so it has a bunch of unnecessary things that you don't need? Everything you need and more than you need. Because that's everything you need and much more. That you don't need. It has all the unnecessary things you don't need. Designed by professional woodturner Nick Cook Ooh. and top Powermatic engineers, the Powermatic 4224B, this is very keyword stuffed, uh, lathe pushes the limits of design, I mean, innovation. I would, I would expect nothing less from Nick it, Cook. It gets better. And durability to give you an unforgettable woodturning experience every time. So you will remember every, every single every one. experience you had. Wow. On this lathe. I was like, this is setting a high bar yeah. here. Yeah. So anyway, the kids have a blast with that. That is, I mean, Nick Cook. You can't. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there you go. That is that is special. <laughs> but I mean, most of this catalog is, I mean, well, actually, you'll, you'll recognize this. So, okay, one thing about this, this is all like pens. There's a lot of pen stuff in here, too, because pen turning and whatnot. But I mean, literally, it has like materials and blanks and stuff that you probably even oh, recognize. Oh, yeah, I, I recognize some of these it's got already. got diamond cast stuff. Well, well, like that? Yeah, like, well, that's actual stone, but like diamond cast material, that's it. That's literally the same stuff, diamond cast. That's Tim McKenzie stuff, right? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, like, there you go. So, it has, like, resins and stuff that we're familiar with. Dang. And it's got, like, pens and all that. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, these all look familiar, don't they? Circuit are those board the pens. Are those the dollar? You, you made one of those dollar pens. Oh, I made a pen out of shredded money and... I'm like, yep, the old pen making world hasn't really changed. Look at that right there. Isn't that a collier made out of that? Persimmon swirl. Yep, persimmon swirl. Right there. You yep. can buy your own. 
right there from Craft Supplies USA. And then the crushed shell too. Yeah. And look, those are those ones with the antique little... gold. That's uh, that's there's a collier out of that too. Yeah, there sure is. So there you go. Pink lady. We made a bunch of pens out of that back in the day. Yeah. And I think that that one looks familiar too. That one marble looks like yep. we, we might have done a premiere in that. Yeah, I think so. I think we've done a premiere out of like half of these materials. Yeah. That we have an ascent in them. Or we did the toucan. Or we did. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Wow. Yeah. Well, all right. Lots of fun stuff in here. So I'm, I read to my kids about like, you know, vacuum pumps and collet chucks and pen mandrels and things like that. And they think it's the funniest thing you wanna, in the world. You know what else Brian did um, in his off time? You might notice that uh, he's got a different mic than me. It's different. Uh, it's mm -hmm. should, it has an integrated pop filter, so he shouldn't be popping. But also you'll notice that his is lower than mine. That is it because is. he took this thing home, chopped it in half, and re-welded it I to did. be shorter. <laughs> I did. So Am I modified it myself. That's why he was like, "Yeah." I was like, "How did you get that?" This, done? These are the same mic stands. Same mic stand. This is as low as it goes. And I was like, "Drew, the thing is like in my friggin' face because of my short torso." So he's like, just like gonna... hacked it in half and rewelded it. I did. It looks really good. You can't can't hardly tell. Can't tell. No, yeah, very can't well tell. done. That was the goal. Um, I have something that I forgot to mention that is going to upset you quite a bit. Oh, I would love to be upset, please. So. Brian gave me with this gym that I made for Archer or built, uh, assembled for Archer. Did you um, modify the wood that I cut up for you? Did you use something I had crazy to, with it? I had to. Um, so I needed it to be slimmer because okay. it was too close to the light. I needed okay. I could, the, the the two by two wasn't wasn't working, so I needed sure, you know sure. I cut two I cut it in half, so at, you know twelve yeah. by two, yeah, uh, twelve by twenty four. Um, I don't own a saw. I don't understand. Uh, how you I, function in the world, but I have, you also know somebody who owns many saws. I do, but I'm like, ah, I'll figure something out. Um, mm. So, all right, what'd you do? <laughs> what what MacGruber okay. operation? I, did you I set saw. Up I here? have a I have a drywall saw. You know, a little pokey thing. I'm like, no. Oh we'll, my gosh. We'll leave okay. that alone. We won't do that. I mean, that could get the job done, but I, I didn't try. Okay. Uh, I have a hacksaw. Okay. So I was like, oh, let me use my hacksaw. Oh boy, that's not gonna work. No. So I got my hacksaw. The handle's so, too no, thick. That's thicker than the blade. One hundred percent. Yeah. So it's I meant to cut like pipe. I know. Well, I know. I forgot. <laughs> so I do my hacksaw. I'm like, all right, get about five inches mm -hmm. in. I'm like, oh wait, mm. no, I can't do this. Whoops. <laughs> so I was like, okay, all right. Well, I did the other side. I'm like, all right. So I got. Oh boy. I just need to get the middle. Oh like, gosh. So I'm like, what do I have? It's like, ooh, I have a Dremel. Oh my gosh. So okay. I had a Dremel. I mean, like, okay. Let, let me put something in my Dremel. Oh my and gosh. And I tried to just kind of like, kind of. This, I ran this is a half inch thick plywood we're talking about. Yeah, I, I ran it along the line. Can't, can't, couldn't cut it all the way through. Made oh, it, made a nice. I scored it though. I'm like, all right, let me just score it. So on, you get like the squiggly on little, both like, sides. Scoring? I mean, yeah. I, I drew a line, so oh, it was gosh. moderately. Wow, it wasn't too bad. So I'm like, I scored it. Could still couldn't get all the way through. So I'm like, all right, I bet you I can just snap it right now. Oh no, I can just snap the thing because I've scored it. I've, I've snapped wood cleanly before. Um, that drywall saw would have been better than what you're doing here. Dang it. <laughs> so, of it course, has a blade with teeth. <laughs> I snap it. Oh, God. And because it's layered plywood uh, with three layers, yeah. what it did was just. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then I just yeah, kind of ripped it and pulled it. And <laughs> the edge was just so <laughs> bad. You didn't install it on your ceiling like that, I did just, you? I faced it away. So, oh, you don't, my gosh, you don't see the bed painful. part. <laughs> You're going to point it out and be like, Brian cut that up for me. And people are going to be like, does he have any idea what he's doing? Look at that edge over there. That's crazy looking. Uh, no, you can't see that unless you're over on the plate, on the plate, Jim. So, uh, wow. yeah, it was bad. Okay. I need a circular saw. I just need a Ryobi battery powered so I can use the same battery as my weed whacker. I know it's like. You're I halfway can, there, man. I can get one for like 45 bucks. I yeah. know. It's like stupid that I don't own one. It's a very versatile tool. I know. And I borrow my brother's all the time, but his, he left it outside one time and it's ruined now, so he couldn't. Okay. He, and he lives near me, so like I could have borrowed and You could buy a handsaw for like 10 bucks. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. Not a handsaw. Yeah, it's a little. Oh, yeah. Those are cheap. <clears throat> no, I mean like oh, literally a oh, handsaw. Oh, an actual saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you saw that little, you could do that for very, very cheap. I, that, yeah. I might even have one that I can just give you out of pity. <laughs> I told you it was gonna. I was doing. It, I'm like, oh, Brian's gonna be so upset with me. Uh, I'm. I was upset with myself. I'm like, this is shameful, Drew. Like a saw is one of the most basic tools. Well, I like. I, why don't I just a box saw? Like, why in the world don't I? Oh my gosh! Because anyway, you don't saw things. I mean, I, 
I saw them enough. I've borrowed my brother's handsaw like four times. Like, there's no reason I shouldn't just have one. Anyway, you got to oh. tell me more about that Home Depot sale when we're done here. So anyway, all right, we can help you out. Hook you up. That was no affiliation. That was my shameful, shameful thing. All right. Well, as we look to wrap this thing up here, um, we got a little bit of company updates to share with you. All right. Well, one video that we have gotten now, our, our editor was a little under the weather. So we got a little behind on the videos, but don't worry. We have a bunch that we filmed and that are going to be coming out over the next month. So we'll keep them coming. Um, but we did get one out this week. Hopefully all goes to plan. Haven't published it yet, but we should by the time this video launches um, about how to get back into fountain pens. So this was a concept that I came up with that was basically coming off of the question that we always get like, hey, I've got some old pens that were in my drawer that my whatever family member gave to me or something. I haven't used it in a long time. How do I, what do I do? How do I get back do into I it? Begin? How do I yeah. restore it? What do I do? You know, that kind of a thing. There's some basis of knowledge, but not enough to actually, you know, just go it alone. So I did that. I will be honest, this video is very like word and like my face heavy. Just didn't have a lot to like really show necessarily around it, but there's some solid content in there. So go check that out. Um, and if you like it, please share it with folks that you know who are trying to get back into fountain pens. If someone's like, oh, you're into fountain pens. Yeah, I bought a fountain pen one time or my, my mom gave me one when I graduated. It's yeah. just been kind of sitting there. Like that's the type of person that this would be good for. Exactly. So go check that one out. And uh, the other thing we've been mired in, um, changing our project management system. So um, we've been using Basecamp for years. We've moved to ClickUp. And uh, yeah, no affiliation with either of those other than we're paying for them, I guess. Is that an affiliation? I don't know what you can say. They're not paying us anything. I can tell you that much. But anyway, we're using it. We've been planning this switch over since like March of this year. And really before that with research you and stuff like that. You have been spending a lot of time It in has there. been. Yeah, it's like all my free time basically has been like setting up all this stuff because there's a lot of different ways to make things happen in this program. But anyway... None of this affects you all directly in pretty much any way, other than once we're kind of through this, it should be a little easier for us to stay organized and on top of our work, which thus means we might be able to produce things better and more efficiently or whatever. So I don't know. That's been happening and just it's a company update and where the whole company's switched over this week. And so we're all kind of dealing with that, um, but it's good. A lot of good things. Kudos to happening. Brian. He, he's been working a lot. We've got, you know, you and Sam and Rachel have been just killing it. And I, and I know a lot, that- A lot of behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. I know. And and it, I know that it is not an easy thing for you to wrap your head around. Like it is a lot of procedural not, organizational stuff. Not my stuff. favorite place to no, live No, but you, have been, way, you but have been yeah. stepping all into it though. So I know how hard it is for that. me. We have similar wavelengths and I just, yeah. I know how- yeah, it, it's been it's, it's a lot. It's been impressive. So hats off I to you for that. That, that is not you. that's not one of the more fun parts of CEOing. Yeah, well, it's got to be done though. Not yeah. as fun as sitting here for two hours with your best pal talking about fountain pens. Talking about saw adventures and yeah, that's right, and fountain pens. There you go. So I think we've done enough this week. We're gonna go and wrap this thing up. Well, we want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us questions so that we can answer them. Uh, check out goodlypens.com for all the penny things. And uh, yeah, shoot us an email at pencast at goodlypens.com, especially you audio folk. If you're like, stop talking about pictures and videos that I can't see. Ooh, also, if you're an audio person, you would like to email me and tell me when you usually download this thing. Oh. Uh, let me know. I'm kind of curious about that because I have been publishing this on Monday mornings because mm -hmm. people... I, I have read some articles and some datas and things, and apparently like, podcasts get a lot of downloads Monday morning. So I've been okay. doing the video on Friday, podcast on Monday. But this past one, I did it all on the same time. So if you care or have an opinion, let me know, because I absolutely have no idea. There you go. Just kind of doing whatever at this point and seeing if it changes anything or makes anybody mad. So I don't know. Let me know. Fair maybe. enough. But we have a pretty poor feedback mechanism for audio folks. So it's like we Just don't really know. Just basically email. Yeah. yeah. Email us. All right, and then I got a random fun fact. You ready for this one, Drew? Bring it. Just this week, there was a record broken at the World Pumpkin Championship Pumpkin Way Off. Oh, for the so heavy, we got heaviest a hef pumpkin. A hefty pumpkin. Yep. Travis Gain Gain. Oh boy, I read the article, but I did not actually know how to pronounce his Geinger. name. Geinger from Anoka, Minnesota. Um, he just won with his pumpkin named Maverick. Thought you'd appreciate that. All right. This pumpkin weighs. I feel the need. The need, the need for, for seed. Oh, uh, wow. 
Good job. Good job. Um, this pumpkin weighs 2,560 pounds. It's like a car. 1,161 kilograms for those on the metric system. Uh, it is the largest in North American history, maybe world history. I'm not sure. This is only his second year competing in this. He broke his own record from 2020, which was 2,350 pounds. So he smashed his own record by, what, 210 pounds? So we've got some kind of pumpkin savant over here. Isn't it just kind of like you have really good soil? Or what's, what, what, do you, what do you do to get a giant pumpkin? I think this is a question on everybody's mind. Oh, my god! How do you grow such a giant pumpkin? I don't know. I think I'm going to do my own pumpkins next year. You're going to grow pumpkins? I'm going to try. Yeah? Yeah, because we just don't like going to pumpkin patches. You find it easier to grow your own pumpkin patch than go to a place that uh, already does that? Ask me next year. Okay. I will give you an answer. You can also like buy them at stores. Yeah, we wanted to do something fun for Archer. So we'd be like, hey, look, we grew our own pumpkin. Or rather than, oh, we went to Lowe's. All right. Which I've already done that. Like, Here, have a pumpkin. <laughs> Here's a pumpkin. Here's a pumpkin from Lowe's. You should buy a pumpkin from Lowe's. And like buried under some leaves and be like, we have a pumpkin patch. There and we be go. like, go pick his own pumpkin. And he doesn't really know because he's in like, playing in his jungle gym. Completely dumb. Yeah. That's right. Fool your children. <laughs> Make less work for yourself. But he's at the age where you can you can tell him most things and he'll pretty much believe it. My kids are getting more skeptical. It's getting harder to get away with things. He's pretty but skeptical. He's, is he? Yeah. He, he just likes to doubt everything I say. Mm. just to be argumentative all right well you and shannon got to team up you got to like pair up together if you're both into it then he's not gonna he's not gonna push back he's gonna be like yeah because there is a pumpkin patch in the backyard yeah i bet you could i bet you could pull it off we'll try maybe i'll just put one under the christmas tree there you go he he wants a halloween tree next year he's like why that's a thing i see that he's like why why, i wish i wish halloween was at christmas time and instead of like a christmas tree was a halloween tree and there was a Halloween spirit that dropped off presents. And I was like, well, why not Jack Skellington? Because, you know, he can do both. It's like, no, that this is a new thing I'm inventing. I need a new character. I was like, oh, geez. Okay, buddy. God, he did not like that. He's like, no, no, no. He's already established in other holidays. This is new. This is a new thing. Sorry, buddy. This is a new thing that I invented. That's the same thing, but I'm just calling it different. Yeah, he's like, it's a, Christmas, right. it's a Halloween spirit. For, like, he, it was right. from something else that he, like some TV special. I was like, you're stealing something too. Anyway, anyway whatever. We're at, nothing's new anymore. We're, we're, we're all just rehashing the same thing. We ideas. are 100%. This might be the longest podcast ever. Two hours, 18 minutes already. Oh my gosh. Well, we should end it then. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great week. We'll catch you on the next one. Right on. I can't really do the you did the clap thing. I you mean, totally did. I know people that can do it like, like way louder. See, yours is a lot. Yours is louder than mine. Mine's not. See, I can't do that. That's the Chris Walmire. Yeah, it is exactly. That's exactly what I'm thinking. <laughs> he invented about. it. I can't, All right. I don't have like. A, I can't disconnect my fingers to like <laughs> flap them with hand. Do you want to hold up your? Uh,